All right, good evening. Welcome to the uh, Delinquent Township Committee meeting, November 16th of 2020. This is uh, being held remotely via Zoom, Zoom remote access, um, 7 p.m. for Delanco Township. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Brown. Here. Mrs. Patrick. Here. Ms. Holland. Here. Mr. Olette. Here. And Mr. Templeton. Here. Let's see. Also present, Mr. Schwab, our township administrator, Mr. Fox, our township engineer, Mr. Heinold, township solicitor, Mrs. Lord, municipal clerk, Mrs. Martin, deputy municipal clerk, Mr. Fenimore. There he is. Uh, Superintendent of Public Works, Chief DeSanto. Oh, that's his on here. Excuse me? Is the chief here? I don't see him. We got uh, Aaron Provenzano, our technical specialist. And have I missed anyone? I think I got it all. Uh, defer to flag salute. Uh, Sunshine statement. Uh, please be advised the proper notice of this meeting has been given in compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act in the following manner. Written notice has been mailed to the Burlington County Times, Courier Post, published in the December 27th, 2019 editions. Written notice has been posted on the official bullet board of the Township of Delanco at least 40 hours prior to the meeting. Um, Mrs. Lord, how much of the remote access information has to be read or should be read? Uh, I think just a statement that the um, remote access meeting has been um, published yeah, uh, and on the website and on the front window in accordance with executive orders 103, 104, and 107, and that the uh, for this meeting, and that the uh, public may participate via remote access via the instructions that have been on the website, on the front window, and on this agenda. Okay. And then skipping down to the remote public meeting access, uh, remote public meeting statement. Um, that advance public comments um, can be accepted via written letter or electronic mail um, no later than six hours prior to the start of the meeting and sent to the municipal clerk's attention via uh, ma uh, regular mail or email on that um, the public comment session, um, the public may make comments or have questions during the meeting, public comment sessions via the Zoom or through participation um, by muting, um, by unmuting themselves and, and when the meeting is open to the public. And the agenda number three, the agenda document is available, is available um, for this meeting on the Delanco Township website and it gives the um, ad, uh, website address with the extension to access that, uh, the agenda for this meeting. Very good, thank you. Uh, public comment statement, purpose of the public comment section is, session is to allow residents to share information and or views with the Delanco Township Committee. Since the committee may be hearing the information for the first time, it is not always possible to have issues and questions settled within the public comment session. Uh, report of advanced re remote meeting comments and questions. Uh, I is did not receive any, any advanced um, questions or comments via mail or email. All right, thank you. Welcome chief, hello. Hello, good evening. All right, and the chief is in attendance. The uh, meeting's now open to the public for comments and questions, session one. Uh, if you have a comment and question, please identify yourself, uh, name and address, and uh, any questions or comments from the public at this time. And Mayor, they will have to unmute Yes. To be heard. Hearing or seeing no comments or questions from the public. This comment and question section of the meeting is now closed to the public. Uh, comments and reports. Uh, start off, uh, Mr. Schwab, Township Administrator. Mute. Thank you. Uh, number one. This week is the requested deadline for budget submissions from departments and offices. I've received most of them. I've even even received a couple from the organizations. They have a little extra time, but I'm sure I'll get the rest of them before the end of the week and start working on them to get things to you in January. Uh, the most important things I have here is we received from the Joint Insurance Fund our annual dividend announcement. Uh, doesn't need a resolution, but our dividend is $22,000. $17. Uh, 
Uh, it's approximately the same as we've gotten every year. Uh, every year I've requested that it be used as a credit against next year's actual assessments. And that just needs a signature of the mayor. So if no one has any objections, I will uh, proceed in that way. Any objections? Yeah. Okay. Hearing none. Thank you. Consistency is the most important thing with that. So we do the same thing every year. Okay, I will have the mayor sign that. We will move forward. Uh, the other thing I have is kind of last minute. I normally would have sent you an email on it. deals with our photocopier. I've been negotiating with uh, Stuart Office Equipment for Xerox. Uh, our uh, lease, we finished paying it off. And uh, none too soon as the copier, after uh, seven years, I think we've had this one, is giving us all sorts of uh, headaches. And as I mentioned a year ago when we tried to do this, but they messed up a little on the state contracts, the costs of operations have dropped significantly. So you get a new machine and, and believe it or not, the lease cost is less and the operating cost is less. The other plan is that we would get a, this is to replace the machine in the administration office. Uh, we own the one in the police department. Um, and we, the recommendation is that we make this a machine that could do color and we do away with the small color machine that uh, sits over where uh, Aaron McFadden's desk is uh, because the cost to operate uh, is for the small amount of color that it gets done is more than the lease on a new machine. So it's much, much cheaper to add color to the uh, faster, the bigger machine and instead replace the other machine with a $500 HP for the few things they're gonna need to do there. Same thing in the back of the police department, they have an old machine that will get replaced. But that's gonna be a, probably a purchase at a small amount. But right now, uh, Xerox is under state contract. They have a GSA uh, contract that connects to that and it sets a maximum price of 12,917, but Xerox has a promotion. And in order the promotion would allow us to pay $182.85 a month for 60 months, which will cost only 10,000 971, so there's a $2,000 savings by leasing it rather than by purchasing it. And the operating costs is about $1,000 a year less than the current machine. So I don't, normally I have a resolution for you, but I wanna get your authorization to negotiate and proceed with that arrangement. And I'll have for the record for December 7th, the formal resolution, but we need to move on it a little quicker and have it probably in place by December 7th. So I'd ask if anyone has any questions, if not a motion to authorize me to uh, contract for the machine as outlined uh, with the formal resolution for the December 7th meeting. Any, any questions? questions from the committee? We have nothing. All right, ask for a motion. Of, somebody make a motion in a second. Then we'll all in favor. Richard, when you lease, are the repairs covered? Yes. Okay. Yeah, actually, there's a, there's a per copy charge that covers all the everything but paper, and it includes the maintenance of the machine. So moved. All second. All those favor? Aye. 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 Thank all you very right. much. That's all I have. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me go to. With the department heads. Uh, Mrs. Lohr, uh, administration. Um, yes, the report we had our annual rabies clinic on Saturday, November 7th. Now, normally this would be a uh, Board of Health report, but we'll do it during the Township Committee since it's the same members. Um, where a lot of towns are canceling their rabies clinics, we had a very successful drive through clinic where people did not get out of their cars, except if you had a cat in a crate that <laughs> wouldn't come out. And we um, believe we did 89 vaccinations and um, the social distancing was maintained because people stayed in their cars and it was a beautiful day. And it, so it was very successful. Kitty, um, I wasn't there. The um, other members of the administrative staff did operate that. So, uh, Kitty, do you have anything else to add about the rabies clinic that I may have, uh, you know, missed that is worthy of comment? No, it went it went very well. Um, uh, 
the office staff did a great job planning ahead, preparing a form for people that they could fill out online. If somebody didn't have it done online, that was okay. Uh, we gave them the form when they came and um, people seem to be very happy with how we handled it. The vet and her assistant, um, the assistant got on one side of a car. If a dog was in the car, the vet got on the other side, gave them the shot. <laughs> <laughs> and people were went on their way and um so it worked out very well and thank you kitty the other thing is that i just want to remind um township committee and anyone um listening uh that the um volunteer uh, anyone that is interested any of our residents or at least 18 years of age who are interested in serving on any of our boards that's notice has been on the website it's been posted on our community bulletin boards, those um, letters for appointment or reappointment um, are due by December 4th. And that the professional RFPs for 2021 uh, professional uh, staff are due 12-1 and we will have that, um, that deadline is 11 o'clock and open those at 11 for the professional RFPs. And that's all I have right now. I'll, I have more to report later on during the COVID report. Very Thank good. you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Public Works, Mr. Fenimore. Mr. Fenimore, are you there? Oh, he's unmuted. Hang on, he is going to talk. He has something to say. Hang on, I'm going to help him out here. Yeah, he remuted. Did he remute? Okay. I yeah. yeah. I saw him, but now he's gone. Hang on one sec. Oh, there he is. He's mute video yeah. and mic. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. I'm gonna see if I can do it for him. Oh, there he goes. Mr. Fenimore, good evening. Do you have a, a report for Public Works? Hello? <laughs> okay, hang on a second, everybody. I will, uh, let me just give him a call. All right, how about, uh, I'll, uh, uh, Chief DeSanto, I'm going to go move on to you and we'll come back to Mr. Fenimore. Thank you, Mayor. I don't have uh, too much to report. Unfortunately, I don't have any updates on the pedestrian crossing flashing light. Uh, we did provide traffic control for them to do some, uh, I guess, road work. What I understand is they ran some electrical lines across the street in preparation, but the uh, lights aren't up yet. And also um, I need to follow up with Thor Construction to reference the fencing gate for the uh, Vine Street. Some information in reference to the uh, Gateway Park. I know we've re recently had some vandalism there uh, a couple of times. Uh, through the GIF instead of money, we were able to purchase uh, trail cameras and we're gonna be utilizing one of those trail cameras for that Gateway Park. We're gonna uh, reach out the assistance of um, Public Works, get us a ladder so we can put it up at a height where no one can reach it. And also, um, we just uh, received our cable lock. It's actual, uh, it's a lock, it's cable type, but it locks it so no one can remove it if they do get up the tree. So we got finally all the pieces we need, the SD card, the cable lock. So we're planning on deploying that this week uh, to help uh, catch anyone or, and we continue to do uh, spot checks as well uh, during uh, dark hours. Uh, reference to the um, ongoing improvement for the detention area, I just want to keep the committee up to date. We've met with the architect, myself and the Lieutenant three, three times. He's in constant communication with the Department of Corrections and the Juvenile um, Justice Commission and they're gonna be partners and they need to be included in the loop because they're gonna have the final sign off to give us uh, you know, the blessing. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, it's a little difficult. You know, they uh, don't uh, seem to catch everything at once. We make the adjustments and then they say, well, what about this? So that's mm -hmm. ongoing, but uh, we're, you know, we're moving along. And like I said, uh, plans have been submitted to the uh, DOC and we're waiting to get feedback uh, to make sure that uh, we can proceed to the next stage. Um, 
crossing guards, schools back in session. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, we hold off in terms of cases. I'll report some uh, COVID information when we get to that section. But uh, we, uh, we, we found one additional crossing guard. We're in desperate need of two more. We have all the critical corners posts covered as of right now. And um, you know, with the, the hybrid uh, schooling there have, the, you know, the amount of pedestrian traffic isn't that high, but um, you know, I'm hoping that uh, by the time they go back to full regular days and everyday school, we'll be able to uh, be able to provide personnel at each uh, post at, at what we did last year. And um, that's all I have for now. Like I said, I have some COVID information I'll share and cautions that we're taking. I can add, if I can, on the uh, crossing, I get the emails about the from the contractor and trying to get the electrical approval from PSE and G. That's what's holding up uh, finishing that job there. They had to send them a site plan and they have to have their engineer come and inspect it. And once that gets done, PSE and G will issue the okay for the electric and then the contractor will pop up the poles. Very good. Thanks for keeping on that. Mike, is it okay if uh, I have John? He's going to talk. I just want to make sure you guys can hear him. John, go ahead. Start talking. Let's just see if they can hear you. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Can you guys hear him okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Go ahead, John. Okay. Uh, we started leaves last week, and um, everything's going along pretty good. Uh, the wind has brought down lots of leaves now, so we'll be out. Uh, we put about a half a ton of asphalt out for patch. We removed four requests from the shade tree uh, request form that we got done finally. Uh, met with Harry on the road project, um, got the drainage uh, on Chestnut, the drainage on Hickory. And um, so the cleanup day, we only used one dumpster. That's the least amount of dumpster we've ever had. It wasn't too good. We did good on tires and pretty much on TVs, but uh, the trash, I guess everybody's putting trash out due to, you know, everybody being home. And that's it. All right, how, John, how close are you sticking to the uh, your schedule of streets and, and parts of town? Are you able to meet? We're, we're like a day behind okay. right now. We're uh, we're fin we finishing, I think, Rain Cocos in Washington. We were trying to get done today, and then we're going to go to the little side, which is uh, Ash, uh, Union, and Buttonwood over on that side. Um, we'll be on there, and then we have the back road to get, and then we'll be through um, once through the whole town. But it's, the, the first pass is always the hardest because there's so much debris. Um, we've had a lot of sticks clogging the chutes up, so that's a pain in the neck. They try to get up there, and then um, we put a hole in one of the screens, but uh, we got that fixed during one of the rainy days. So, and we've been out every day, even if it's been raining. So, um, we're, we're trying to keep up the best we can, but just a lot of leaves coming down all at once here, which is the way we like it. And we can get done everything and uh, get back you know, to the corner sooner around town again. All right. John, John, would you report on the work you have contractors doing at the two basins, West Avenue and the Newton's Landing? Yes. Um, the, the contractor removed the fence, I think a couple of weeks ago. He's back in there tonight. He's got one tree left, and he's even coming back in. He's going to bring a, a brush hog with him, and he's going to get where all the weeds and the vines have been grown up the fence. He's going to mow them down for me. And I didn't even ask him to do that, so that's great. And and the Newton's Landing Basin? You talked to the farmer? Well, the farmer, the farmer said that he would be doing it. Um, you know, the weather's been a little hairy now. Uh, he was coming over last week to look at it to see what's going on. Um, but he's had he's, he's a farmer, so he's been doing soybeans, and he said he's been, you know, having a little problems. But uh, 
but uh, hopefully he'll get over here. But I also contacted uh, uh, Realty, who takes care of Newton's Landing, and I asked them if they do it, and they said yeah, and he gave me a price of seventeen fifty, and I think the farmer does it for fifteen. So um, if the farmer can't do it, I'll just get these people to do it and get it done. And you also you had all the uh, the trees and the stuff cut out by you had a contractor in there. Yes, uh, I'm not. Uh, everything got messed up again. I'll get back one of the trees and and finish. Uh, you know, I'm waiting, still waiting for the shade tree to. No, I mean in the basin, John. Yeah. Didn't you have somebody had to cut all the weed trees in the basin before the farmer came in? Oh yeah, there's there's not that many. Okay. There's not that many out there. All right, so you took care of that. Everything's cleared up. Be back with me, Larry Roar. And if he has a problem, I told him if you have a problem with something, just let me know, and we'll come out there and we'll take care of it. That's all. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. John, question. Uh, did you catch that uh, somebody dumped a couch up by Echo Pallet uh, right in the middle of the street? What was this there? There's a couch uh, dumped um, in the access road going back to Echo oh. Pallet. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll get yeah. it. Yeah, I, I can't believe somebody put it right in the middle of their road there. <laughs> yeah, I can. <laughs> yeah, all right. Thank you. <laughs> I can. It, believe me, over the years back there, that's been a, a, a good dumping ground. <laughs> All right. Let's not publicize it. <laughs> Anything else, John? No, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks for the great work. Thanks for being safe. Yep. All right. Uh, I think I got everybody on the department heads. Uh, professionals. Uh, oh, Mr. Heinold. Good evening, everyone. Um, I have a couple of items for executive session, but for public, just an update on One Hawk Island. Uh, I've been following up with the title company. We should have that title report this week or next week, according to them, which is good news because the title work has really been slow due to COVID. Um, and Harry, on that, uh, that piece of property, I just wanted to check with you to make sure your office runs that that lot to make sure that there's no DEP history that we should, um, we would have to be aware of in terms of immediate reporting those kind of concerns. Yeah, absolutely. Can, can you send me the lot and block numbers? I will. Okay. Thanks, Harry. 2300, lot one, correct? Uh, I could look it up, but you're probably right. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was that, Mike? A uh, blocked, uh, well, one. we'll check it and I'll send it to you. I don't want to misspeak and have you chase something incorrectly. No problem. <clears throat> All right. Uh, anything else, Doug? Not at this time. Thanks, Mayor. All right. We'll, talk and we'll see you again at the executive. Uh, Mr. Fox. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I touched on the important parts again of, of my report. Um, the uh, road programs, the uh, DOT local aid, as well as the local fund uh, contract, that's all one contract. Uh, as you know, we awarded that um, contract at the Paving Plus. We had a pre-construction meeting last Tuesday um, and went over the, 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 the project with the uh, police department, uh, the administration, John, um, uh, the state was there. They actually did have someone show up for that. Yeah, wow. Uh, kind of not normal. Right? They must be slow. I don't know. Um, but but that, that was good. Um, and we, uh, we, we try and tie down the schedule. Um, they're, they're looking at starting December 7th or maybe before. If we have, it looks like it might be before because I have a nice stretch of weather coming up. Um, but the latest they'll start December 7th to do the concrete work. The way the contract is writ written, they have to do the, all the concrete work before the uh, end of this year. And then the paving, if the weather's nice and we agree to it, they can start some of the roads paving if we, re if we strongly feel that they can finish it. Um, if not, they will wait till the spring to do the actual paving of the roads. 
Um, we were planning on starting on the state section first, which would be Spruce Street and Lilac. They're the two strict, uh, state contract roads. So they would do those two first and then Walter would be, be the last road they do. Um, we also, for the drainage uh, for Hickory and Chestnut, we had a construction meeting for that as well. Uh, after the meeting, we went out to the site and, and reviewed everything with John, as he mentioned, uh, John Fenimore and uh, the contractor. Um, so we know where we're gonna store everything and, and how we're going to, to proceed with the project. He's looking at starting the week after Thanksgiving. Um, as soon as we know exactly, I will let everyone know on both of these projects, as well as they have to notify the residents in the area 48 hours before they, they start any, any work in that, in that area. Um, the West Avenue Park, uh, the, the, the county grant money, as you know, we have money left over in that grant that, we're, that we wanna use up. Uh, I met with the contractor. I also met with John Fenimore on that. Um, so we have it tied down uh, what we're going to do. We're going to be putting a, a stone parking area on Memorial uh, Avenue. Um, we're going to outline the, the, the stone with uh, pressure treated six by sixes to make it like a curb, uh, keep everything in place. John and I reviewed the type of stone we're going to use. Uh, it's, it's called a DGA. It's a, it's a more compact material that, that it's not just clean stone that's going to roll around the kids can throw around. Um, so everyone's happy with that. If we have money left over after that, we're going to grade and add additional infield mix to the T-ball field, T-ball lot. Um, we should have enough money to, to do some of that, if not all of that. So that that's our plan at this point. Um, 200 ash that's on the discussion just, line, so like excuse me harry just process wise if rex okay with that no one has any objections you'll get a change order after the fact instead of doing it in advance usually yeah as long as everyone's okay with that once the final stuff is done hopefully you'll have a change order from december 7th but if not the next meeting um at the rec meeting harry uh jack haynes suggested some kind of stone for that uh parking lot there because we realized that Beverly and Delanco are not going to be able to redo Memorial Drive for some time. And he was supposed to email me the type of uh, stone that would um, actually compound or compact really good. And, but I didn't, I even emailed him for an update. He didn't send it to me. So yeah, it, it's the DGA um, that, that I spoke of um, that, that John, John Fenimore knows about as well. Uh, okay. It is. It's a. It's a type of stone we use on stone roadways. Uh, All right. So yeah, I'm sure that's the same thing. It'll last. It'll be. It'll last for quite some time. Oh yeah, it'll last, it'll last quite some time. And then if if we ever do pave the road, you can just pave right, right, right on top of it. And it's a okay. Great place. All right. Good. Mm -hmm. Um, the uh, longer discussion I have is the CDBG grant for for this year. Um. I, I sent out a, an email today. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone got a chance to, to read it, um, but we we did have a, a Zoom meeting with the county. Janice and I were, were in attendance. Um, we can use the money for um, anything in the right of ways um, of the township and, and or the county uh, or any properties that the township owns, um, the money can be used for, as long as it's in that census tract that we, that we talked about before. Um, so we have, you know, uh, options, um, and, and I understand that I think it's a priority to, to address the sidewalks on Cooperstown and, and Cooper Street. Um, so I, I worked up some numbers on that. The, uh, in addition, I spoke, I spoke to Joe Brickley, um, and he's pretty much out of the picture is helping us out on doing any work on that road. They, uh, they're kind of washing their hands of it now. Um, but I did do an estimate for the work to fix that low area between uh, Hickory and Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, it's going to require replacing the curb, raising the sidewalk, and putting in some drainage structures. Um, that that price was up to um, $170,000 uh, construction cost. 
once we get the topo done, original topo done, we can tweak that number a little bit, maybe get it down. Um, but without seeing the topo on what how much drainage we need, um, you know, that that's my best guesstimate at, at this time. The issue with that is um, the the only thing that the, the, the uh, CDBG people were concerned with was dealing with the county. Um, the county's notorious for being slow in their permitting and, and whatnot. So they were just concerned about the timeline. Um, I, I don't feel that's going to be a problem if we can start it right away on it. Um, but it is going to take longer than normal to get through the county's process. Um, also, the CDBG money is generally, it's, and, it, and they indicate it's going to be about the same as last time. So it's about $78,000 that we would receive. Um, so we're, we're short of funds if, to do that whole project, you know, at, at 170 versus the 78 that we're going to get. Uh, the other areas were the sidewalk in front of um, Town Hall and Public Works. Now that that project would be a lot easier, obviously. Um, you're only looking at about $30,000 to, to do that work, uh, which now leaves us an extra 48000 that we want to spend, which could be spent anywhere else in town in the census area. Mm -hmm. um, doing pretty much any work you want to do. You, you can use it for paving, for sidewalks, for drainage, any work you really want to do as long as it's in that area. We, we, did, um, we did talk about doing the path and the um, tree planting, for example, that Scott had as a plan in front of Field of Dreams. That's within that census, right? Correct. So that's another- That could be done. Another item, those would be the asphalt path tied into the way that he did the fence and tree planting on either side of it that kind of thing all within the right of way could be done or within that kind of thing i don't know that it's an additional forty thousand forty eight thousand dollars but certainly another item to think about harry with the uh your master plan for the cooperstown road you know from burlington on out is it worth um adding a, a engineering to get a topographic study for Pennsylvania, just the, the part between Pennsylvania and Hickory. So we have that data. So whenever the time comes and the county finally comes around that that's, you know, we've got, okay, well, these are the elevations we're working with. It certainly would be helpful. Um, absolutely. It, it, you know, it's going to have to be done and, and, you know, it doesn't go bad. So if you do it, you're, you're right. We could have, we could have a, I can get a better estimate on what would be done there. Um, and it would even help on the application because uh, we can actually tie down what we're going to be doing. Yeah. Uh, that's, but it's not a competitive application. I mean, if that's the yeah, project exactly. we want to do, we can do that. I'm just thinking that you do the master plan, which is in the consent agenda. And if that's where, based on the master plan, you then decide where you want to spend more money. And that could be the next phase, which is that's where you want to have them do the detail. Um, but if you're right. If we're going to do this, if we're going to use CDBG funds there anyhow, we can't use CDBG funds for engineering, only for construction. <laughs> so we would then be paying them to do that work. Uh, but you can't do part of the job at 170. You can't use just $78,000 worth and stop it with that. We would have to supplement that with our own funds. Yeah, that's, that's we have about 40000 we have 40,000 in capital funds that we had allocated for sidewalk that I thought we were going to use for the municipal building and public works, which is to cover what area is estimated 30,000 now. If we spend it, use CDBG money, then that money is available for a future project because we control the timing. We don't control the timing, perhaps, on what's going on at Cooperstown Road uh, with the county. Just ideas. Yeah, and, and there's really no way to do just a part of that section. I think right. we it's pretty much you have to do it all or, or none. There's not it's not something you can phase. Yeah. So I mean it's doing drainage work on a county road, correct? Correct. In the county right away. But it, it wouldn't be actually in the road. We're gonna have to put yard drains along the, 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 the right of way in, oh. in the grass strip area. Wow. But that's needed anyway to fix the the 
drainage issue at Hickory. So eventually we're gonna have to do it to keep it from flooding. So we're just taking 78,000 off of our books then. Is that right? That's correct. I mean, eventually it should be done. Yeah. Uh, and the county's yeah, not going to do it. Do it. Right. Yeah, yeah I'd like to see that done more than tree planting at Field of Dreams or, or wherever we were just talking about. That's just a minor piece of it. Right. You know, it's only a few thousand dollars, but the main thing would be the sidewalk on Cooperstown Road in front of the municipal properties. Harry, I'm very disappointed to hear that uh, Joe Brickley has washed his hands of this. I, I, I don't know what's going on out there at the county, but... Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I heard he's looking to retire. I don't know if there's a new one coming in, but uh, this, that, that's wrong because they, they did vow to help us at the bottom uh, the drainage issue and at the top uh, by the railroad. And now uh, it's their road. Why can't they? They offered me and they took the trees out. They, they offered, uh, you know, to use their labor contractors. And now all of a sudden it, it's just gone. Yeah, they won't even, um, they, initially they agreed to have a limo do the topo survey. Yeah, um, yeah. And they backed out of that. They're, they're, not, they're not even going to do that. Mm. Wow. I don't know what changed there, but it's a 180. <laughs> All right. Hmm. That's disappointing. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, so, so essentially, we have to, the, the, the application is due December 18th, um, and we have to have a public hearing on it at the next meeting, which this, I think is the 7th. Seven. Seven. Um, so we have to decide what, before the 7th on, on what we want to do, uh, what we want to apply for anyway. Um, and our two choices are to, if we do that section of Hickory, Pennsylvania, the town's got to come up with the rest of the money. Um, or you can do in front of town hall and public works and look for other things to add to that um, throughout the town, throughout the census area, that, that we could you know, make up the rest of the money. Do we, Richard, do we have enough money in our capital account to, um, so that we can do Cooper, Cooper Street and Cooper Town Road? It, you know, you'd, have, you'd probably have to add it to your 2021 budget. The down payment money would have to do another ordinance. For our share, forty thousand is the most we have. Oh, that's all we have. Right. Because we're using it for um, Walters, Walter Avenue. No, no, the sidewalk work we have specific allocation for sidewalk. Well, this now, is more than 40. sidewalk, though. This is more than sidewalk. I mean, so it's not just sidewalk. Right. We're doing drainage. But in terms of road, road and drainage are specifically aimed at the, those projects that we just awarded. We don't have any extra road or drainage money that is not already allocated to projects. Oh, okay. I thought you we have, could, yeah. you'd have to add something for that. The only thing where we had, as I said, we allocated money for the public works and municipal building sidewalk that when, we, when this plan was done, when, and we, and, and you'll see there's a $10,000 engineering to do the sidewalk plan. So that'll come out of the 40. So that brings down to 30 for actual construction. So yeah, we would have enough our own money to do that work. But if we want to do the work uh, along Coopertown Road, that's 170,000, you'd probably have to appropriate another 100,000. Uh, plus there's engineering that is not a part of these costs. So we need probably more than 100,000. Well, I think, we, I think that's where we should, what we should aim for. I don't think the sidewalks in front of the township and um, public works are as important as that. And I think we should reach out to the county again and find out why all of a sudden they've abandoned this issue. That's my, that's, that's how I feel about it. I drove by the municipal building today about three o'clock, 3.30, and there were quite a few uh, workers uh, walking down Coopertown Road, um, right over the railroad tracks. It was a shame. There were uh, two young ladies, um, not young. I mean, they looked like they worked up the street, but they just uh, one of them right out in the road and not really uh, paying attention to the cars. And then when I pulled into the municipal building, I noticed that the pedestrians were on the opposite side of Coopertown Road. 
And I thought, well, that's a little bit odd when there's more room on the municipal side. So I don't know if they're coming from strip steel or if they're crossing over to, I don't know, it's very weird, but um, yeah, we have to stay focused on, on this area of uh, pedestrian safety. Um, it's been something I've been chasing for quite a while. Um, I just uh, don't know how the county can get away without fixing their own road. And um, that's all, I, it's a shame about the money, but thank God um, there's money coming in. So the, the, the sure thing would be the sidewalk continue with what that, uh, what we budgeted for capital, the sidewalk at public works in the municipal building and uh, continue with Harry's original, with the uh, master plan for the sidewalks for the whole run and collectively or individually we'll make ourselves a nuisance to the county and see if we can get them pointed back in our direction. Any other options or choices there? That's pretty much it. <laughs> Anything else, Harry? Um, nope, just uh, like I said, we have to make our, our decision on what we're applying for before the 7th, before December 7th. All right. Okay, we got a little time, a little time to think about that. Let's get her. Get it. It's going to happen as I'm going to uh, publish the uh, that there'll be a public hearing on Dece uh, December 7th at that meeting, at which time uh, the township committee would pr present what they plan on applying for in this grant and then give, give the public the opportunity to comment on that plan or any other suggestions that would come from the public. All right. So, so should should she advertise the uh, the hundred seventy thousand dollar project, asking for seventy eight thousand of CDBG money for that, under the assumption that we will uh, make up the difference uh, in the twenty twenty one budget setup capital program, which it's not unusual to do a hundred thousand dollar capital program where you'd put ten thousand down and or I'm sorry five thousand as your down payment five percent and have a hundred thousand dollar project to supplement the CDBG money and that money will be available to use in 2021. Uh, my understanding is that the one year that we have to complete the work and spend the money will take effect either in the spring or summer of 2021 will be the starting date so we have until 2022 to complete it so that from a time standpoint making that commitment would be the way to go where you're asking for the money for that sidewalk work and then we're going to use our money to supplement the drainage and road and anything beyond that so that would be the way to to advertise and hold your public hearing everybody agree with that but are we still at the mercy of the county and uh i guess permitting or because it's their road yeah and that's a time issue harry believes that if we make this commitment now, and then you're gonna authorize him to make a proposal for the engineering work. So you'll authorize that probably at your January meeting and they'll do all the grades and so on. You also have to budget for that, of course. Uh, and uh, we should be ready to go. So we'll have a year to get the project done, which should give us enough time, right, Eric? Right, yeah. All right. Okay. Everybody okay with that one? If we're doing sidewalks there, should we include the sidewalks with that contract for um, in front of the municipal building and um, public works? I mean, would that benefit us at that time since we have that money set aside? Well, if, if, Harry, if Harry finishes the master plan, after you've looked at the master plan, you're going to make some priority decisions. If the decision is to move ahead with that and he thinks we can combine them, I'm not sure CDBG is quite as flexible as DOT about combining their stuff because it's federal HUD money with non HUD stuff, but it might be possible to get a better price. Yeah, correct. And I can always check that out. Yeah. Okay. So good point, Kate. Yeah, that would make sense. If they let us do it. Yeah. And you're prepared and that's the priority after you get Harry's master plan, then we'll go from there. I just have a question on your report, Harry, the seawalls at the end of the streets. 
Have yep. those end caps finally been done? They have not. Jeez. They have not. Um, it's like pulling teeth on this contractor. Um, well, the, the ones that, that face the roadway, they've all been done. But the ones that are, are, are perpendicular to the, to the river, they were, not, they were not put in. So they did half of them, essentially. Um, the half that you can see. Yeah. Right. What's interesting is contractor hasn't bothered billing us for anything either. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a lot. He's done, you know, 90, 99% of the work and only billed us for what, 70 or something. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, we're holding a lot of his money. We're holding tons of money. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. But he has to defend himself in the lawsuit. So that's another story. Anyhow. All right. So there's agreements that Janice knows how to uh, advertise. I believe we do. Okay. 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 All right. Uh, we're all done, Harry? Yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. All right. For you now. All right. Council committee. Uh, let's see. Kate, would you like to start off? Okay. Um, I had a successful meeting with uh, Jackie Bartolucci at River's Edge, and I can see that there's a resolution on the agenda tonight to start the in rem foreclosure action. Um, well done. And um, I also, uh, I didn't have an animal to go through the rabies clinic, but I'd like to commend the uh, staff for setting that up. It was, it was just so smooth. And it looked like the residents were just very happy about not standing in line in a public works garage with dogs barking like crazy. So it was, it was just a great, I don't know who thought of the idea, but they should, uh, kudos to them. Um, Okay, I attended the library virtual tea, which was a wonderful event. We picked our package up at 10 and our tea started at 11 and it was for an hour. Uh, it was really, really kind of neat. We played, uh, had a game. We made a tea cup out of uh, Play-Doh and uh, it was fun. Um, I installed three bricks at Gateway Park, one for Marlene Jazz, one for Freddie Weller and one for the Johnson family. Um, recreation is, um, Todd Johnson came to our meeting and we're going to have a virtual tree lighting and welcoming Santa and Mrs. Claus this year. We're going to actually tape it so that we can, um, have it viewed on Facebook and YouTube for the residents. Uh, we'll tape it beforehand so people don't actually come out so that we don't have to worry about social distancing with a group of people. Um, the gingerbread house decoration, since we can't have that at the firehouse this year, we're actually gonna purchase uh, the gingerbread houses and have residents register to have them so they can pick them up for their children to actually decorate and they can take pictures and send them to us. Um, the carriage rides have been canceled, will be canceled. Um, the winners of the best um, Halloween decorated house for 731 second was first place, 225 Edgewood was second place, and the third place was 326 Rancocas. So Aaron is actually sending letters out to those residents and each one of us, uh, let's see, I'm gonna do 326, Alyssa, um, Ela Pena is going to do 731 second, and I think, or Edge, I'm not sure, and Phil's going to do one where we're going to go and give them their certificate, their um, money, and um, take a picture and maintain social distancing somehow. Uh, 200 Ash Street, there was a letter from um, Bill Baxter, and um, I guess we'll discuss that later. Um, Let's see, the history board, we are changing the, uh, they would like to have the name changed to the history board so that when they are doing an event, it can just be Delanco History Board instead of Delanco Historical Preservation Advisory Board. Um, we're working on signage at the Triangle Gateway Park uh, extension and the Hickory Street School. 
they did launch the veteran site and I understand that that was taken down and I did submit some information to Doug to do some research on that because most of the information obtained was through interviews of veterans as well as um, applications where residents actually filled out the form to be included in the booklet that was then going to be put online. Uh, so I know Doug's going to do some research on that. The Liberty Trees, um, I think there were 25 planted in 1976 and um, the board is hoping to uh, work with Shea Tree to replace the trees that are no longer existing. I think there's 13 left and they're going to do some sort of signage. Uh, they're, they are going to work with Shea Tree on that. Um, I've contacted the library to see if they had space for the history board to keep their uh, books uh, and some periodicals for residents to go into the library and actually view them there. They wouldn't be able to ch check them out because we would be you know, concerned about somebody not bringing them back. Um, a lot of stuff here. Let's see. Uh, DISA has their last soccer game on uh, the 18th of this month. Uh, they're gonna be working on spring sports since there's uh, no basketball this year. And Phil advised me tonight that uh, Environmental Board and REC will be meeting with DJ Fenimore to discuss his Eagle Scout project either Friday night or Saturday. And I hope to attend that meeting. So I think I hit everything, thank you. Thank you, a lot of material there. Thanks for the good work. Oh, wait a minute, there's one thing I did forget. No, no, um, we're, we're all done. <laughs> Dean, Martin. Dean Martin was at, at, at the history, at our history board meeting, and he indicated that he had given you some information, Mike, regarding the permit denial uh, that DEP uh, can no longer defend, and that he actually uh, brought up on his screen the aerial shot of the Zerbrook mansion, um, the, um, where the bulkhead was, from 1940 and it's an aerial shot and you can actually see it and he said that we should have no problem because they've changed their position on allowing bulkheads and seawalls to be restored to the prior locations he told me that he gave you that information he told us he reported it so anyway uh it looks like we can move forward with that and the aerial was pretty good that he just brought up hey who, his, who is that what name was that Dan Martin, he's on the um, news board. Gotcha. Yeah, that's what we've been doing on the DEP for the last 12 years. We've had that photograph. We've had other photographs. Right. Well, apparently they can no longer deny uh, it because the uh, district uh, attorney, or I guess it's the attorney general's office, yeah, they said that there's no defendable position for them to deny um, a waterfront to be recaptured, I guess, is what you would say, or to be rebuilt in the original place. So um, I have his wording here. If anybody wants, I'd be glad. Um, it's, he said that um, they were informed by the deputy attorney general that a denial was, was not defendable. They settled issues, specific denial permit without having to go to administrative law, thus preventing a precedent being established. So his recommendation to you was to um, contact them, make them aware that you have the knowledge of this and have our position that any denial would be appealed and that they would probably move forward with us. And I think Harry, you had met with someone who was uh, in agreement that we could do that. So are we moving forward with that? Yes, I, I, I met with the assistant commissioner um, at the site and he agreed that, that, that and he didn't bring up the, anything about legal issues, but he agreed that, that, that we could put the seawall back at the same location. Uh, um, he's been on vacation this week, uh, well, last week. So his, his, next, his, his day back was, month, was today. Um, and he hasn't returned my email or call yet, uh, which I'm sure he swamped with the things. So I will touch base with him again tomorrow. Okay, great. Thanks, Harry. Yeah.
Thank you. That's it. I'm done. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Arlette. Unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, with the uh, Joint Land Use Board, and this probably goes back uh, probably about 12 years ago, maybe 13 years ago. Uh, I know Kate was in, uh, on the Economic Advisory Board at the time. John Brown may have been, uh, where we were looking to uh, combine double lots and, and get a single home on there. Well, uh, I don't know if this is the first one, but on Hickory Street, where we had the one house fire, and uh, we ended up acquiring the land. Uh, the Joint Land Use Board approved a house to be built on there uh, at our last uh, Joint Land Use Board meeting. Uh, there's a couple modifications that they have to do. Uh, one is flip the uh, the house from the garage being on the right hand side to the garage being on the left hand side as you're looking at the uh, property. So uh, the house is going to fit into the neighborhood and uh, I think it's a probably a long awaited uh, achievement. So uh, happy to announce that. Uh, and the other thing is uh, I need to uh, thank the committee and the uh, administrative staff, public works, uh, with the election, uh, uh, with the way the numbers are. It looks like I won and I'll be on the committee again, but being on the committee, uh, it can't do, and we, the township committee, can't do uh, the things that we do without the folks at town hall that really are the uh, engine that drive things, uh, that get the work done. So I wanna thank everyone at town hall and, uh, and the township committee, because I don't think I could have won the election without everyone else's uh, support over the years and doing the things that we're able to accomplish for Delanco. And I think the residents realize that. So, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vern. Uh, Mr. Brown. Yes, good evening. Um, I attended the uh, GIF meeting via telephone conference last month. Uh, nothing really to report other than uh, what I reported to Aaron. Um, you know, all is good in Delanco. It looks pretty good. Um, <clears throat> Shea Tree met uh, last month at the end of the month. Uh, we did uh, finish one of the uh, sidewalk enhancement projects um, at 1400, 1403 Burlington Avenue, but it's really down at the end of Fenimore um, going toward the railroad tracks. You get a chance, stop by, take a look. It's another paver project uh, trying to save that uh, ginkgo tree and, um, you know, work with the, uh, the root systems and so forth. Um, we had a problem in town at the end of the summer with the spotted lantern fly. Uh, two people, two residents, one in Newton's Landing, one on Pennsylvania Avenue, had requested us to remove the trees because of the spotted lantern fly. And uh, so I went out sort of haphazardly, but uh, was shocked when I saw, oh my God, they're all over the tree. So they really uh, did infest the trees. And um, we're looking into ways to uh, deter them. Uh, they're all dead now because of the first frost. So we were advised that uh, they would die off. However, they may have laid their eggs on some of these trees. So uh, we're gonna be looking into how to, uh, to get rid of them. Uh, it's funny because spotted lantern fly came around and you don't hear about the emblash borer. So maybe nature will have a way to, to uh, get rid of them. But there are ways to defend it, you know, that we're sharing with homeowners such as uh, putting duct tape uh, in reverse around the tree spraying them with a soapy water solution to knock them down to the ground. I mean, as far as like C1, kill it, that's not working anymore. There's too many of them. And uh, people in Delanco were chasing them little critters all around on their decks and, and everywhere. Good exercise. Yeah, so. John, were they maple so we, trees? Uh, they like maple I trees. Were yeah. they maple trees? Because there was, a, yeah. there was a tree at Gateway Park that was pretty much infested with them when I was yeah. working there. 
Yeah, they like the maple trees, but they're not they're not going to destroy the tree. Um, it's just going to be a nuisance. So um, we'll work on it. But, you know, it's not the shade tree's position to uh, spray pesticides on those trees uh, trying to get rid of them. So we're going to Rutgers University is working on the problem. A lot of people working on the issue. So uh, we'll keep you posted on that. We have the winner not to worry about it. So uh, basically, um, I thought the election was uh, very smooth in town. Um, I saw numbers that we've never seen before in, in the voting. Uh, so I think uh, perhaps maybe the way that it was done could be a wave of the future. Um, I know a lot of people complained. I personally thought it was very convenient. And uh, I think uh, Janice and staff did a great job. Um, I did see people across the street at Pearson School. Uh, not quite sure what they're all doing over there, but it was pretty steadily trafficked over there. All day. But uh, yeah, if you still have a sign out, go get it. Just, just kidding. <laughs> Every, everything looks good. And that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Ms. Allen. Hey, um, I'll start with the congratulations to Fern um, and all who won in our in our town. Um, I had a meeting with Mike and the county park officials over at Zerberg Park, but I'm sure that's going to come up in his report. So um, I did come to the county COVID call. Um, it was an update at the time, but you know, six days later. <laughs> Numbers have continued to rise, but at the time uh, we were, uh, as a county, increasing 150 per day. They were freshly announcing the Pfizer vaccine. Um, Burlington County is expecting to receive 50,000 doses um, around January, but that's a drop in the bucket. It's going to go towards the uh, healthcare and frontline workers, which is something around 500,000. So. Um, <clears throat> A lot of talk about contact uh, contact tracing. Um, they're struggling to to get in touch with everyone. They're they're basically triaging at this point. So if you're in an obvious position, youth sports or schools, and one person in your class or in the organization was uh, tested positive, they're not letting all 30 members of the team or or what have you know. Um, they're basically focusing on people that, but for receiving a a call mm -hmm. from a tracer. Um, they wouldn't know. Uh, average age is declining. It's now at 40, uh, 40 to 50. Um, and they, they spent a little bit of time highlighting that um, if you get notified that you have been in, in contact with a, a known positive, you can't just go take a test and, and test out of uh, a 14 day quarantine. Uh, there's too much risk of it being incubating in you. Um, you know, where, where people have tested negative, gone about their life, and then on the 14th day or 13th day, um, come down with symptoms. And sure enough, they've been spreading it this whole time. So they, they wanted to make sure the public knows that, that a negative doesn't clear you. Um, other than that, uh, there's still the, the walk-in testing at a RCBC, which seems to be going really smoothly, results in 28 hours. Um, and then the other uh, thing unrelated to that, I did make it onto that last minute call for the, uh, for the uh, New, uh, New Jersey, the NJLM marijuana call. Um, and, and just the important takeaway from that while everything is still developing is that the legislation did turn out to be opt out, not opt in. So from the time that the governor signs, we have 180 days to say yay or nay. Um, if you, uh, if you opt in or fail to opt out during that time, you're locked in for five years and anyone that gets a license during that time is grandfathered in. So just things to be aware of that I know everyone is thinking about. So, um, that's, that's my report. Thank you. Um, let's see, as, as, uh, Chris mentioned, uh, last week, uh, uh, had the opportunity, uh, Mary Pat Robbie and uh, Matt Johnson from uh, County uh, Resource uh, Conservation, the parks people came out, uh, looked at the Zerberg waterfront, and we also took them over to uh, the canvas shop. Uh, spent about an hour with them, uh, walking those two uh, properties. Uh, I'll just wait uh, to bring up the canvas shop when we get to that uh, in the discussion. As far as the Zerberg, uh, the seawall, um, uh, 
Ms. Robbie was um, unsure of how the uh, county parks grants uh, would go this coming year as far as funding. And uh, she uh, could not commit on that. She said, if uh, it is offered again, we could certainly could apply. Um, she did say that uh, uh, did offer some, uh, uh, as far as uh, funding support or grant support from nonprofits, uh, mentioned the William Penn Foundation, uh, the New Jersey Green Acres, or excuse me, Blue Acres, as far as uh, soliciting uh, grants to uh, help uh, with the seawall project. Uh, we walked them up and showed them uh, one of the three street ends where we uh, put the seawalls in uh, last fall. And uh, uh, I do, re do remember that Ms. Robbie asked, it, asked me several times how much that cost. I think she was uh, just couldn't uh, believe how expensive that was. So um, they're happy that things seem to be moving forward. Uh, I've been talking with uh, Matt Johnson off and on through the years on, on on the Zerberg and he's been as frustrated as we have uh, that uh, we haven't been able to make any progress with uh, with the state, but uh, Harry was able to achieve a breakthrough uh, a month or so ago. So uh, hopefully we can keep this momentum moving. And uh, I'll stop there and we'll talk about camera shop when we get to that in the discussion. Uh, any last comments from anybody before we move on to the uh, consent? All right, consent agenda items. Uh, consent agenda items are considered to be routine, will be enacted in a single motion. Any item requiring discussion will be removed from the consent agenda or consent agenda items will be reflected in full in the minutes. Uh, does anybody have any items that they want pulled for separate consideration or just a question that we answered now before we uh, get into the consent? Um, I had one small point on the first one, 2020-14 uh, on the vehicles and parking. Uh, the chief, uh, your email to Janice, uh, I think I think there's just a word missing or a typo. You're, you're, you're in agreement to, to have this uh, no parking area extended, correct? That is correct. I was approached by Public Works. Um, yeah. They indicated since it's a dead end area, uh, they have to you know make a U turn to get out of there yeah. for loop collection purposes. Yeah. And um, and when the vehicles parking in those particular areas, uh, we addressed one area uh, last year, the area that's parallel with the tracks. Uh, but then um, they informed me that there's one little additional piece that they would uh, like to have clear. So when they go down there, collect the leaves, they can make the U-turn and get out right. without worrying about backing up and, and causing you know uh, damage or harm to somebody. No, no, good. Yeah, I understood all that. that just reading your email, your response to uh, Mrs. Lohr, uh, like I said, I think there's a, a word missing. It sounds like you were against it and then agreed to it later on in, in, in your email. So I just want to clarify that. So uh, any comments? or anything for the consent before we go on. All right, ordinance 2020-14, uh, amending chapter 1295, governing vehicles and parking, first reading by title only and set public hearing date for December 7th, 2020 at 7 p.m. Uh, resolution 2020-126, uh, uh, refund tax over payment. Resolution-127, resolution to cancel and refund property taxes due to uh, total veteran exemption pursuant to NJSA 54 colon 4-3 yeah, I think it should be a semicolon there, 30-30A, excuse me. Uh, resolution 128, uh, authorizing change order number three for landscape maintenance contract for Field of Dreams, contract 2018-20. And there was a late add on that, a late amendment to that, right, Mrs. Lord? Yeah, that's been correct? corrected. I sent, the, sent that out um, where it was, should it say throughout the body of that resolution change order three, some of the change order one. So it's just a, a, a type hour from the original, from one of the other templates. It's been corrected. Very good, thank you. Thanks for catching that. Uh, resolution 129, uh, resolution approving right of way use uh, to cross river fiber. Uh, resolution 130, providing for insertion of any special item of revenue in the budget of any county or municipal municipality pursuant to NJSA 40A colon 4-87, chapter 159, public law 1985. Uh, resolution 131, resolution authorizing professional services for comprehensive pedestrian study and sidewalk master plan for Cooper Town and Creek Roads. 
Resolution 132, resolution of the Township of Blanco in the County of Burlington State, New Jersey, authorizing in rem foreclosure of a tax sale certificate for Block 500, Lot 1.01, held by the Township of Blanco. And uh, thank you, Ms. Fitzpatrick, for your work on that. Uh, resolution 133, authorizing 2020 budget transfers. Uh, payment of bills. Uh, we've got two dates to accomplish here. Um, current fund uh, from October 23rd, $499,124.25 for 11 uh, November 6th, uh, $747,198.32. Payroll for October 23rd, uh, $141,408.52 for November 6th, $99,812.15. Capital fund for uh, October 23rd, $7,635.00. For November 6th, $31,570.00. Uh, dog fund uh, for November 3rd, uh, excuse me, November 6th, uh, $30.00 even. Uh, Gateway brick fund uh, for October 23rd, $182.00 even. Escrow trust fund uh, for October 23rd, $10,498.90. For November 6th, $12,615.75. Housing trust fund, uh, November 6th, $297.25. Municipal open space, October 23rd, $9,801.05. November 6th, uh, $15,245.03. Approval of minutes. Uh, let's see, August uh, 3rd, 2020, August 17th, 2020, and September 14th, 2020. Approval of consent agenda. Motion, please. I move. That was... Holland, so moved. Holland, thank you. Second? Second. Burn. And Mr. Allett. Roll call, please. Mr. Brown. Yes. Mrs. Right. Patrick. Yes. Ms. Holland. Yes. Mr. Allett. Yes. Mr. Templeton. Ran out of voice. Yes, thank you. Uh, meeting open to the public for comments and questions. Session two. Uh, any questions, comments for the committee or professionals at this time? At this time, any members of the public wishing to have uh, have any questions or make any comments, please unmute your microphone. Um, state your name and address for the record. And for the record, Mayor, I have nothing in the chat queue at this time. Very good, thank you. Last call for questions and comments uh, during this public comment session. All right, uh, question, comment question session of the, of the meeting is now closed to the public. Correspondence, please. Yes, we do have some correspondence. Just grab that folder. Okay, the first piece of correspondence is that um, we see we, Township Committee uh, and Committee Woman Kate Fitzpatrick received a letter from Sandy Chant Iwanicki. Uh, my sister Suzanne and I would like to thank you for the decision to approve the Chance Farmway sign in memory of our father and grandfather, both bus drivers for Delanco. Our Chant, Chant family has called Delanco their home for over a century. This town has meant so much to us growing up here and living the farm life. What a wonderful way to commemorate all the long hours our farmers have put into this earth. My sister Suzanne continues to farm on the very same fields our dad once did. Thank you again for making Delanco an exemplary small town. Sincerely, Sandy Chant Iwanicki, Suzanne Chant Avery. Janice, can you just read the, the, the first, the very first part of that? Your, your audio completely broke up there. Wow. I didn't know there was a lag. Okay, it says, um, my sister Suzanne and I would like to thank you for the decision to approve the Chance Farmway sign in memory of our father and grandfather, both bus drivers for Delanco. Any more? I, that, I think that was the part. Did everybody get that? Yeah, I got it. I got it from the first reading. Very nice. Okay. Very nice. Okay, the second piece of correspondence. Let's see. Um, is from a letter of resignation from the Joint Land Use Board uh, from C Chris Kloss, effective immediately. So um, Mr. Kloss, 
who I believe uh, is that alternate number one, Kitty? Three. Three. Thank you, Fern. Um, has resigned from the Joint Land Use Board. Now, and his term was expiring the end of this year. There is a vacancy, um, but again, that that alternate term does expire at the end of this year anyway. Would the committee like to take action on this letter of resignation? Um, I know Mr. Kloss has offered or given a huge amount of, uh, he's got a wealth of experience uh, that's been valuable to the, to the planning board and uh, uh, with regret that uh, he's uh, decided he's unable to, to continue there, but uh, appreciate his, his service and volunteerism. Is there a motion to accept Mr. Kloss's letter of resignation? I'll, I'll move to accept with regrets. I'll second that. And I think an all in favor would be appropriate. Okay, rather than please. Uh, would you like a roll call, Mayor? No. I, or on all, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Aye. you. Thanks. Um, we received a, I received an um, email uh, correspondence from Anthony Leo from RLS Logistics uh, requesting that no parking be established from 5 a.m. to 8 p.m. for both sides of Enterprise Drive for 1,000 feet from Coopertown Road. And he uh, cites that right now trucks are parking on both sides during the day and it is very unsafe. So um, I'm entering that as correspondence. Yeah, he I'm sorry. What time period was he asking? 5 a.m. to 8 p.m. for both sides of Enterprise Drive for 1,000 feet from Coopertown Road um, back up along uh, Enterprise Drive. Mm -hmm. I saw so, that parking when I went to the Misfits opening and it, um, yeah, it was amazing all the trucks there. Um, at first, I thought maybe they were there because they were holding the, their uh, ribbon cutting in the parking lot, but they're there all the time. <clears throat> Just and, trip, and, right? and uh, for the record, and I believe that the, it, it's a township municipal road on Enterprise Drive for the first 800, I'll say, and 40 feet, correct me, plus or minus. Mm -hmm. So if that is correct, if I have my number correct, then his request for 1,000 feet would mean that um, part of that no parking request would fall on under roadway that is under, um, oh, who does the trusses? NVR. NVR, yes. NVR, yeah. So the first 800 and some feet, and Harry and Kitty, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's 830 some feet plus or minus is municipal road on Enterprise. And then it, it goes to, private road MVR and of course there are um, certain um, restrictions or access easements that are granted to the other businesses on the MVR part. What? Yeah, and Gladys, I am checking that out to see what that distance actually is. Um, I, I have that in my records. It's 848 point, it's, it's some odd number. It's in the resolution. I have a file on Enterprise Drive because of all the questions from time to time so I there is a resolution with the exact footage okay um, but the other thing I do need to mention is that when or uh, when um, yeah NVR got their approvals they did get approvals to stage their trucks on their driveway Ooh. that's part of their joint land use board approval on whose driveway Kitty? theirs and they're part of the they can stage their, their trucks along their driveway so um that is part of their land use board approval from back in the nine whenever they got their approval 90s early 2000s so but, uh, but are there out there and it's 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 kind of all cats and dogs some of the trucks are ndr some of the trucks are, are rls's and some of the trailers are misfits. And it's, uh, 
uh, everyone's got a piece of that mess out there. But well, the, first, the first 800 and some odd feet of Enterprise Drive is a municipal street. Correct. So and there are people who are parking on their driveway would not be Enterprise Drive, if I'm right. interpreting not, that. Not the first 800 and some odd feet, That's correct. Right. So, so, we, so we could approve a, a no parking for that area. So Doug, Harry, um, what would be the next step to address Mr. Leo's request for no parking on both sides of Enterprise Drive? I guess we, we, under township jurisdiction would be that first 800 and some odd feet. Right, exactly. Yeah, we, we can write a recommendation um, from an engineering standpoint on, on not having parking there. And we'd have to do an amendment, but the only concern I would have is making sure we're conveying to everybody out there what is uh, being contemplated so that nobody is uh, taken by surprise. And if they have input, I'd want to know what it is before we make that, that amendment. Sounds prudent. So maybe, maybe what we do is do the uh, analysis through Harry and then circulate that to the to the interested parties out there with an indication that we would be looking to move on that and we want feedback. Yeah. Is a trailer versus truck any different? Because it seems there's uh, trailers uh, stored along the uh, north side and not attached to a, to a tractor. So it's, again, you have storage trailers being stored on the on the street there. So is there a difference? In my opinion, there is, yes. If it's not connected to to the, the tractor part of the of the of the unit, um, it is just storing a trailer. On the street. Take a look at that and see if it's all trailers or if it's a truck and trailer. It's a combination of both. Yeah it is. Um, I've seen it where they've had the trailers there, but then they have, uh, I guess, some type of, uh, I don't know if it's a tractor, but uh, they just hook up and then they pull that trailer to whatever location they're pulling it in. And then it comes back and picks up another uh, trailer to, uh, again, take to a destination. So it sounds like they bring in, the, the tractor and trailer come in and then they disconnect there and then they have another vehicle that comes out and picks it up yeah. to move it. Later, yeah, yeah. they stage them. It. I think they call them like yard jockeys. Oh, uh, okay. Gravic was up and running. Yeah. They would use that to move their trailers around their lot. Uh, I would you know, recommend that we stay away from the 800 feet and make it a round number. You know, based on Harry's report, stay like 600 feet so we're not even getting close. We'll see where that falls to the, uh, the various entrances for those for RLS and, and Misfits if it extends that far back. You know, if it's something that we can, if the 840 feet reaches to protect those entrances, you know, and, and makes those entrance uh, to those uh, parking lots easier to get in and, and protect sight lines, then, you know, just see what it looks like, see where that 840 feet falls. I agree. Chief, have you had any feedback from the uh, patrol officers that go in and out of that area? No, no, no negative feedback. No. The only negative feedback is uh, uh, there seems to be a lot of activity, calls for service at Misfits. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anything else, Mrs. Lohr? Uh, we had just had um, been, uh, I've been copied on an email from um, Mr. Baxter of the Historic um, Advisory Board. It was to uh, Ms. Fitzpatrick um, and, uh, regarding recommendations <clears throat> for the structure at 200 Ash Street, but you'll be addressing that in the discussion item. And that is it for correspondence. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, just to close out, uh, Harry, you're gonna look at the 840 foot distance and We'll see what that comes up with, and then maybe we'll 
as a township, we'll uh, put together a letter to address to every, all the users out there, um, RLS, Misfits, NBR, and uh, AC Power, uh, and anybody else that we don't know about. Well done. Sound like the right way? Yep. All right. Harry, I'll, I, if you want, I can get you the information that I have, if that. That would help, yeah, thanks, Dave. Okay. Janice, did you get anything from Tony P E D Z O L D T regarding the fence ordinance too? Zoning laws? You didn't get that? Yeah, I Kate, Kate, that I was, got that. I got that responded to it. Yes. Rick, that oh, was okay. Richard. Okay. And he did he did respond. Cause, because I got it directed to me too, and I just want to make sure because that was okay. Yeah, well, we're going to bring it up when we talk about the fence ordinance. Fence, right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Status of uh, coronavirus disease COVID 19 update. Uh, well, we've all been hearing the news and hearing all the uh, stuff on TV and closures and restrictions and so forth. Um, wear one of these, wear a mask. Keep your distance. Um, be safe. Uh, the holidays are coming up. Uh, I spoke at the school board meeting, uh, commented there. Uh, you know, yes, the numbers are going up. There's a lot of testing. It's probably more widespread, and we're, they're they're catching more positives. But this is uh, this is everything that's been forecast that it would uh, really ramp up uh, this time of year. Uh, the holidays, families getting together, everyone's worn out, everyone's tired, but please, it's, it's uh, personal, your own per personal decisions, your per personal risk assessment, and you and your family. Uh, I, I begged, implored the, the school system to do whatever to get the message out, out for their kids. Uh, the students, the young people uh, just don't seem to be abiding by anything. Um, but uh, whether or not they're dragging it home for their parents or uncles or grandparents, um, yeah, a lot of people just have mild symptoms, uh, cough, sniffles, you know, uh, can't taste something, but enough people get uh, lifelong debilitating, uh, long-lasting uh, uh, after effects, and there are fatalities. Um, our numbers, uh, uh, as I said, I just got home a couple hours ago, uh, last numbers that I saw were uh, 110 positives. Now that's a cumulative number, but two months ago we had 65 in Delanco. We're at 110. So we picked up, uh, what is it, 50 uh, or so in the last uh, uh, 30 days uh, in town. I count so, 20 in the last three days. Yeah, it's, um, uh, but, it's, it's gonna be personal decisions, personal responsibility. Uh, this holiday season is gonna be different and we're gonna be in this for a while. Uh, whether people, you know, there's lots of positive good news on the vaccines, but uh, you and I and, and average people are, uh, are, are, are not gonna be seeing a vaccine probably until the second quarter or, or the summertime. Uh, as, as has been mentioned, the first batches are going to first responders and high-risk medical personnel. Um, uh, and uh, I happened, uh, I was on a Zoom call uh, a seminar uh, last week um, and Dr. Fauci spoke at that. And uh, he, he said that the, based on what evidence they're seeing is that they believe that the vaccine is probably only gonna be good for about a year or two. Um, based on its relationship to other flu type uh, coronaviruses that, uh, that they have experience with. So it's, it's not gonna be a one and done thing, but uh, um, we have a long way to go on this and uh, everyone please be careful and pass the word and, and protect your families and get the word out to everyone you know. Um, anyone have anything to add to that? Or we'll get on to uh, the CARES Act uh, with Mr. Schwab. And Mrs. War. Okay. Um, the, we uh, did apply for a CARES Act grant for reimbursement for PPE supplies, the personal protection equipment supplies. Uh, we had previously applied to FEMA. Um, submitted was $14,846. 
Uh, we were denied some of our submissions, plus the deduction that they um, is a copay for, for the township. So we're gonna be reimbursed approximately $9,800. That's the FEMA. So in the uh, CARES Act grant to the state, we did apply for what was FEMA denied and the percentage deducted by FEMA, plus additional expenses for additional PPE supplies, particularly for the police department um, for disinfecting. And um, also too, we did put in there the uh, bump out or bump in of, for the new uh, service window. So the total requested under the uh, CARES Act uh, CRF grant was $41,383. So keep our fingers crossed. Hopefully we'll get funded uh, all if not most, uh, most of it through, the, through this um, CRF grant. Yeah, and, and I really note that the, we were allocated 54,000. Right. That was the ceiling. So the hope is that as long as it stayed under the ceiling, they would be able to reimburse us. And that, that uh, calculation, that, that ceiling that Mr. Schwab mentioned was based uh, on demographics and a bunch of other factors that had no relation to what you actually spent or what you actually had out of pocket uh, right. uh, since last April. So uh, it had uh, no bearing on that. Um, I, I would like to thank and uh, commend uh, all everyone administration, uh, Beverly, uh, Beverly Russell has been keeping track of the PPE. Uh, all the department heads have been managing their own PPE supplies. Uh, uh, and that includes uh, the school and the library, um, but administration and everyone's been, uh, been really, it's been great. Um, and, and Bev Russell did spearhead uh, getting this grant. Um, she actually put it together, she typed the narrative. Have all the information. Yep. And we have a we have to submit the um, actual um, spreadsheet with the expanded. Um, there's another part to this that Bev will be working on that has to be in by December 10th. Yeah. So it's not done. There's a, this is a very um, detailed, uh, very intense um, grant. Uh, so this is this the submission was just part one. The application is part one, but the detailed expense. Right. and expenditures still needs to be done and Bev will be uh, handling that. I'm working with the chief and Bob Hudnell, uh, Richard and myself on that. Yeah, um, yeah amazing work by everyone, uh, Bev Russell, everybody, just to keep, keep, it, keep it straight with all the changing rules and, and the deluge of information coming down. Uh, executive orders update, COVID policy procedures and amendments. I believe that's Mrs. Lohr. Um, the executive order 191, I believe it is, let me look on the sheet, require the two, we were doing already most of the things recommended by the CDC in our COVID policy that was done earlier um, during the first wave of COVID. Um, this executive order 192 that went into effect uh, this month, November, Basically, the two main things that we had to accomplish was the requiring employers, both public and private sector, to um, uh, make sure you have social distancing at the workplace. So uh, we had um, one area that was kind of a, a choke point. So we did um, maneuver things around, and it was a very simple move. No, no funds were expended on, on getting that um, taken care of. The second thing is that we had to develop a more robust um, self self-assessment employees have to do a self-assessment before they come into work and um, report on that before they um, or as they're getting to the workplace the initial plan was and development was to actually have everyone do a self assessment and self checklist sign it every day put that in but it was modified to be where you just have to will sign a log when you come in you'll initial a log that you did perform these um the self-assessment before you get to work and that includes taking your temperature and answering a few questions about your conditions and if you've been in any high risk areas so uh instead we won't have that paper glut with everybody bring a, bringing in a form every day and even our gif 
came out with guidelines and it did confirm that we can do a, uh, an, a log that you did perform the self-assessment and that will cut down on, on, the, on the paper glut. And in your packet um, is the amendment uh, to the COVID policy for employees, um, self, uh, shared service employees and 30, third party contractors that come in for a length of time um, providing services inside the municipal building um, or on the police side um, that they uh, conduct the self the, the exam and they and they sign off uh, and initial a log um, and that's reflected in the um, in in this and then if it's accepted by township committee as reported then uh, we'll roll out this new procedure because right now our the policy just said that you know you know your own health if you're sick stay home and with this executive order 192 it's it that's not sufficient that policy was not sufficient under this new executive order. Um, uh, employees must and come in and initial a log that they've uh, gone through this uh, self uh, self evaluation before they get to work. And um, Are there any questions on on this new policy procedure from any uh, any committee or other department heads? Janice, sure, I want to mention your new scheduling with the employees. Yes, as a way to social distance as part of the plan to make sure right. they're okay. Right, and because particularly in administration, um, that the seating is so close, when, and particularly when the inspectors come in, sometimes we're, it's just really hard to social distance. So we've, the, the administrative staff, uh, we've gone back to alternate days or teams, uh, blue team, green team. So everyone is not in every day. Um, and the days that you're scheduled not to be in the office, um, you're working remotely, just like we did with the first wave. And it was very um, effective. I don't believe any, you know, there's um, much that's not getting done for our residents and taxpayers. And, you know, um, the, the municipal building is still open to the public right now, three days out of the, out of the week. And um, we even have a couple of the um, boards commissions that are uh, meeting having their meetings at the municipal building with the layout with the six feet social distancing the plexiglass dividers and a thorough cleaning the day or two afterwards um, because of the weather it's cold now um, some of them are meeting like outside but that's not really feasible for for the the colder months so but the administrative staff we have um, gone back to um, alternating days to to make sure there's more distance between employees. Um, but with people working remotely, if you're not in, you're still working, you're working from home. Okay. And then um, if there's something you have to come in for that won't wait until um, the day you're scheduled to be in the office, then once the, the day shift is over, then you could come in later in the day when the, uh, the first uh, day shift has left okay. and, and get what you need, pick up the things you need. But it, it worked out fine. Good. Like with the first wave, we anticipate it'll be fine this time. Well done. Any comments on the, uh, the new policy that uh, Mrs. Lord described? Oh, and I just wanted to say for the record that since employees are going to be required to take their temperature each morning before they have to come to work, we, we did acquire, uh, um, we were able to get a hold of a 20 digital oral digital thermometers, not the non-contact because it's going to be issued to a an employee. So if there is an employee that says, I don't have a thermometer at home, um, uh, we have uh, any, have required inexpensive oral digital thermometers that we can issue to them. Okay. We don't want them back. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to sign them out. Do you need a, yeah. uh, uh, is this uh, for this amendment to the COVID policy? Do you need a, is that a resolution or just all I or how do you want to do that? No, I think the way the policy is written that Richard and I have the authority to amend the policy presented to Township Committee. And um, if everyone's um, okay with the, uh, the amendment as presented, um, then, then that's fine. It would be like if someone had an issue or an objection, but if nice. everyone is okay, unless um, Doug, you feel that there should be at least a, um, you know. A... I think the record's clear, Janice. Okay. Yeah, the record should say there were no objections. Okay, perfect. So Kitty can put in the minutes. Yep. Great. Uh, let's see. Status of 
Was there now, was, were there, since that section was executive orders, were there any other executive? I thought there, the uh, governor did an executive order today for um, inside gatherings. He did. Yeah. I'm sorry. He did. He did. Ten, um, 10 inside and 150 outside from uh, 25 to 10 and from 500 to 125. And I wanted to, based on that executive order today, Doug, I wanted to ask you if that affects um, the courtroom. Since some groups are having their meetings inside, does that 10 include the courtroom? Because that significantly changed. Because it wasn't a capacity. Before it was a capacity. Now he's saying 10 inside. Or is it, was that just for private residents? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm going to look at that further. But I think what was carved out were... Um, elements like public meetings. So I'll take a closer look at it when I have an opportunity this week and get back to you. Okay, that would be great because I wasn't quite sure if that 10 was any gathering or just per, you know, private citizen gathering inside or if that um, applied to inside meetings because that would really affect yeah, um, I, the layout of the court. Yeah, what I saw so today was I'll that closer exemptions were religious services Political events, weddings, funerals, and performances. Right. Said so nothing about public meetings like ours. I was thinking about that. Doesn't yeah. matter. Performance. I'm under political. So. Unless it's a yeah political performance. I don't know. Is that <laughs> right? Okay. So, all right. Thanks, Doug. I'll look forward to your evaluation on that. Okay. Very good. Council. But that does affect the last question about continuing to have Zoom yeah. meetings. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe we even consider going the other way. Status of Township Committee meeting for uh, December 7th. Zoom. What's the question? Well, I have a question for um, the Township Committee and, and the, the, in that since we are, are um, continuing to meet Zoom, did you want to uh, look at where all boards and commissions have to meet via Zoom and not have any meetings in the courtroom in the interest of public safety, or is the layout that we have with the chairs and the six foot distancing uh, sufficient and people have to wear masks, that is in the policy. I thought the committee should consider that given the numbers are very, very high. Recreation has been meeting in the courtroom and we're under 10. And it has worked out very well for us, um, keeping the social distancing and wearing masks. Jay Tree met in the courtroom and it did not work out well at all. Uh, we couldn't hear. Um, and two of our members sat out in the parking lot because they didn't feel safe coming in. So our secretary would uh, text them back and forth on the issues. Um, so, I, but our chairman, I don't think he likes Zoom, so. Um, but yeah, I think I, this format zoom, I can hear everybody, see everybody, see your poker faces you know. and, uh, it is working. I just don't know to lay it on, uh, the, the volunteer board members to figure out zoom, I guess Aaron would have to, or somebody would have to work with these, uh, board people to get it done. It's going to be a while before, uh, this thing goes away. Yeah. It's not difficult. I mean, we had a virtual team. The women's club meets Zoom, but um, I know recreation, we prefer to meet in the municipal building. And so far it's worked out fine. Um, See, I, I tend to agree with really small groups. It's it, with that large of a space, you should be fine as long as everyone's okay with it and can hear each other. I do think yeah. the split meetings are the most ineffectual that I've been involved in. I think the people who aren't there in person um, just naturally get sidelined yeah. and talk 10% of the time and everybody else talks 90% of the time. So I, if it's a matter of somebody needing help with the technology, we should be able to accomplish that. And given, even with the vaccines that are being announced, they're still talking about but another six months optim, you know, with an optimistic time frame. So I, I think it's worth spending a little bit of time to try and get people yeah. up to speed. It's not like, like Kate said, it's not that hard. And I think these have been very effective meetings. In some ways we get more input in public meetings now than we do in your traditional format. That's true. 
I, yeah, and the history board meets Zoom too now. So uh, planning board. Uh, Zoom. Ms. Martin uh, Fern, do you have uh, the uh, on how on how your meetings have been going? I found, find the Zoom meeting for the Joint Land Use Board effective. Uh, sometimes it becomes a little bit challenging uh, for someone to display or share a screen of blueprints, but uh, they've been able to work through those those pieces. Yeah, it may take Aaron, a little bit longer, but I think it's been effective. Erin's been great um, figuring out how to share screens and and uh, pull information from the website and show that for participants to see. Okay. The storage authority uh, again it's a small group uh, right now they seem to be comfortable inside the courtroom uh, you're talking uh, uh, the, the five members the secretary uh, and the three professionals and that leaves probably one person or two people from the public. Uh, and uh, most of their meetings, no one from the public comes. I, at, Mayor, if I, if I may, Go. I would ask since Township Committee, each of you um, are liaisons to various, our various boards, commissions, and groups, uh, would you please reach out to them, to the, their secretaries, that they let the administrative staff know if they're meeting in the room, um, if they've met in the room or they're going to meet in the room. That way we know if we have to have a uh, disinfecting of the tabletops okay. and uh, the mister, uh, using the mister on the um, non-porous surfaces or the actually the porous surfaces is what you have to use the mister, the chairs. And um, if they are, what their plans are, or if their plans change, because we also have um, the programming of the door. So if they are going to say, well, we're gonna meet uh, in person and all of a sudden they do a last minute Zoom, yep. that door could pop open and remain open. Um, so it's very important that uh, all the various boards and commissions let us know what they're doing so we can properly disinfect for a group that's been there. And that's any group, right. even, even if the police department uh, chief if you've got, if they've got a training in there or something going on or something that was used. Yeah, we have um, uh, something scheduled for December 1st and December, uh, late, late December. So we plan on the night before, misting it down, wiping it down, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. after the training, doing the same thing. Okay, that's great. Thank you. No so if you could just ask your boards to let us know. Um, that they're planning to meet inside or, or if they're meeting by Zoom, that way we can know if we have to disinfect it or not the next day or and also the door schedule because we certainly want, don't want the doors uh, popping up when we thought a group was meeting at the municipal building and in fact they changed their plans and didn't let us know when the doors are uh, open with no one in attendance. Well, do you, would you like a positive confirmation of, of any group using the, uh, the any part of the building or that? That room rather than just by default now it's on the calendar and the doors are programmed would you rather have whatever respective group say yes we are and just give it to you yeah, I, I think it'd be nice to hear from each group uh each chairperson secretary however it's communicated uh to us so we know exactly um you know if they're going to be in the building or not All right just give you a positive confirmation yes we are yeah. no we are okay yeah, thank you all right uh any other comments or questions on the uh, COVID stuff? All right, discussion items. Um, continue discussion 200 ASH. Um, let's see, as I said last week, uh, I had uh, Mary Pat, Robbie, Matt Johnson, we, um, uh, Chris Holland and I went over, uh, took them over to uh, 200 ASH. Uh, um, they really liked um, the property and its access to the Rancocas. They were very, uh, pleased that the township has that. We made no commitment as to what uh, um, the township uh, was going to use it for, whether it's going to be open space, whether it's going to be developed, whether it's going to be something else or what the status of the building was, but that was um, their reaction, that uh, it'd be a nice addition to the Rancocas Greenway and the trail system. Uh, 200 Ash is right along the uh, Amico Island uh, Pennington Trail uh, that's coming in that uh, was supposed to be 
worked on this summer, but got delayed due to uh, delays in the federal government approval at that end. Um, so anyway, they like that part. Um, they agreed and expressed uh, um, hesitation as far as the building. Um, uh, Ms. Robbie mentioned that the county, I asked <laughs> I asked them kind of in jest if they needed the, any office space uh, for, their, for their department. And they said, well, we, we thought we had new office space uh, at the uh, Ransom uh, Mansion that's up on the Bridge Street, but that burned down a couple of years. But uh, Ms. Robbie said that that was going to be, have a significant cost to the county to adapt that for public use. Uh, I don't recall the exact figure, but it, it was large. Um, but anyway, that, that was the extent of that, that conversation. Uh, separately, um, I uh, contacted uh, an architect who deals in historic preservation uh, and they've done uh, several projects in the region uh, over the years, over the last uh, two decades or so. Um, and uh, they're coming out to look at the canvas shop tomorrow afternoon, um, no charge. This is just an exploratory, uh, just informational. Uh, I just want to kind of uh, pick their brain and get uh, uh, their idea of um, what any ideas that they may have. Uh, I feel that we have to explore all the possibilities and really try to get an idea if, if there is going to be a, a, a use in retaining the building, um, what that cost will be, uh, what that cost to sustain it. Um, and uh, see if that's something that uh, this community can afford and can use. Um, so anyway, that's, that's uh, really kind of gonna be a back of the envelope look. Uh, as I said, it's no cost and this is uh, um, someone I've reached out to and uh, am familiar with uh, uh, over the years. So I'll let you know what, uh, what if anything comes out of that discussion. So uh, that's all I've got for that. Uh, Chris uh, was was on that uh, walk around. Uh, if you've got any uh, comments that I missed or overlooked, uh, you know, join in. No, no. Um, you you summed it up. But yeah, she was awfully enthusiastic about that boat ramp and incorporating that into her plan or into the county's plan rather. So mm -hmm. that the holdup seemed to be the building and and what should be done with it. Um, she did make a comment that perhaps the demo cost that we talked about might be light, but um, anyway, it seemed promising that we could get county support. So that's it. Um, so anyway, it's it's uh, uh, I, I had asked in talking with Mr. Schwab that uh, uh, we were going to have a discussion as far as uh, Mr. Fox preparing, a, or he's already given the estimate to uh, prepare the, the specs for the demolition. Uh, given that the, the initial report that he gave us a couple, two months ago on, on the structure, that there was no real impending safety issue, that uh, we really don't have a pressing need to make a decision right away on something that may be ir irrevocable. And uh, I just want to give uh, us and the community and uh, uh, an opportunity, a little time and space to kind of explore everything. And so that we, uh, we feel good that we've made, uh, we've explored all the avenues that we can and uh, make the right decision uh, for the community. So any comments or uh, questions? Well, I did send the letter that I got the email that I got from Bill Baxter and I think Richard circulated it to everyone. So um, this is also something else to consider. So I'm glad that we're not uh, moving forward right away to demolish that building until we have uh, reviewed any other options that we may have. So um, I will let Mr. Baxter know that we're reviewing, we're, we're reviewing everything. And um, somehow I think if, once we make some sort of decision, Doug, would we have, would we have to have some kind of public meeting with regard to this so the public can be present or would, would we just do it in a regular township meeting? Yeah, I mean, we, 
we can choose whatever course we want in terms of informing the public, but, it, but the minimum legal requirements depend on what we do. And if, if the decision is to do a demolition, it's just a matter of putting that contract out to bid and awarding it. That's, that's all the law requires. Yeah, okay. we, we already had the uh, public hearing on the bond ordinance pay for it. Right. That was done last right. year. So, um, any other comments on 200 Ash or the canvas shop and, and any, any ideas or, or grants or, uh, I mean, there's a lot of people that, you know, come up and I've heard from that, oh, it'd be a great space for a community center or a youth center or meeting space for the respective groups or storage areas for historic or recreation, things like that. Um, but as always in all things government, as we know, it comes down to dollars and can we afford um, to make it uh, make an old 100 year old 110 year old building publicly accessible and can we afford to s sustain that expense every year um, that's kind of what it comes down to um, but uh, you know let's shake all the trees and, and make sure that we feel good about the decision when we do make it so well one of the paragraphs in bill baxter's letter said that he proposed that delanco township actually form a committee a subcommittee of interested individuals or groups, we could do it, uh, to participate, to formulate a plan of action to actively seek solutions for its adaptive use. So, I mean, if everybody gets this letter and reads it, I think that is one thing that we could do if we decide that demolition is not the way to go. But I mean, is it? I mean, because there is money out there to preserve um, buildings, um, but it's, it's not actually a historic, um, site like Zerbrook, but it is an old building. So I don't know. It's just an idea to form a committee, uh, a subcommittee of different people to work on so that, um, the subcommittee could report to us and maybe it could be someone from the township committee, the joint land use board, recreation, all the different um, history board entities in town to sort of work on this. It, it may be something that we should do after this architect reviews the property and gives some recommendations. And they may make a proposal and say, you know, hey, um, you might have something there. And if you want me to do a full up report for you, it's going to cost X. And then, you know, if they, you know, and make a proposal for that, you know, like any other proposal we get from a pro professional, you know, uh, we'll receive that and review it and see if it's worth worth our while and, and uh, you know, is, is get it uh, um, something else that we can look at and educate ourselves on what, to, what we're really getting into, which is the big thing. Um, but I also think that, you know, as, as you say, Kate, there's a lot of a lot of people in a different respective uh, boards and commissions. There's some expertise. There's a lot of enthusiasm. There's a lot of people that just you know go out and and, and work real hard to, to dig up information. And if uh, someone on rec or historic or joint land use board independently, you know, uh, finds hey you know there's this source of uh, uh, funding for community centers or is this. Uh, uh, this entity that does uh, can help you plan a, a project for an old building, um, and just flow that back, back, back to the liaison, back to the committee, and rather than I don't know whatever whatever mechanism we think can work, but uh, we don't want to drag this out too long. I mean, I don't I don't want to get to the middle of of, of summer and have this thing hanging out here, here but. Uh, um, and as Mr. Fox's report, you know, there are some weather issues that uh, we have maybe should decide on if there's something we should do to make the building a little more weather tight and so forth, but, uh, and, you know, try to forestall further deterioration. So uh, there is a little bit of a clock, but uh, I think uh, if, if we tap the resources within respective boards and committees uh, and people can say, hey, you know, this is out there, uh, let's see what we can find out. Any other comments when, on the, the game show? Mike, when will you have the architect's report? 
I don't know that it'll be a full report. I'll talk to them about it. I'm meeting them uh, at two o'clock uh, tomorrow at the canvas shop. Um, okay. If okay. anyone wants to come along, John Fenimore is uh, going to uh, come along uh, to escort us and uh, act as a safety is the one stairwell's uh, not uh, suitable and the other one's uh, dark. So we'll be, uh, but, uh, yeah, we'll make sure this uh, is a forever item on, it'll be a discussion item on every agenda until you make a decision. Cut out. This will be a discussion item on every agenda until you make a decision. All right. Yeah, thank you. All right, the fun part of the evening, fence regulations. Uh, joint land use board rec recommendations, uh, amending chapter 29 governing, uh, oops, that's the other thing. All right. Uh, wants to, we've all seen the stuff that uh, Michelle Taylor passed down from the planning board. Um, I know there's been extensive discussion at the last meeting on this. Uh, I don't know if uh, Mrs. Lohr, Mrs. Martin, or Mr. Arlette want to elaborate on that. Don't all jump in there at once. <laughs> There's and also mention the, if I can mention the letter that uh, Kate mentioned from uh, uh, Jamie Wisniewski, Jamie and Frank Wisniewski, who live at uh, Pennsylvania and Walnut, and they thought that you were going to talk about making it so they could have a privacy fence all the way to the sidewalk, their corner lot on Walnut. And we pointed out that's not what we were discussing, but I bring to your attention that uh, there's uh, the issues of how corner lots are handled and uh, that they have a very limited area that they can have a privacy fence. And they were interested in having a six foot fence all the way to the sidewalk line uh, along one of the sides. Uh, just that's what their letter is about. I explained to them that's not what you're discussing. You're discussing a much more modest change, but I'd bring it to your attention anyhow. All right. Well, well, the, <laughs> again, the, the, the corner six foot um, fence would def definitely have to come before the joint lane use board. This particular property that I guess uh, this initiated with of having, um, I think it's a Like it's they're short a foot from the front of the property going back to, to be able to put uh, the fence there. If they do the four foot fence, there's no issue. But it again it goes back to the six foot fence that, that they wanted there uh, to replace. Uh, Couldn't they do a four foot fence? in the one area and then because there is a property on Walter Avenue that did that at one at, in order to comply I believe um, where they put a four foot fence in the area that that had to be but then it met up with the six foot fence along the property line back further so what would the difference be why why wouldn't that be something they could do or that someone would recommend to them? Well, it could come up to they have a dog. So a dog that might be a jumper. So the six foot fence makes the most sense. And if you duck it to four feet just to comply with an ordinance, suddenly you've got a dangerous dog roaming the neighborhood. So yeah, I know that another lady had a dangerous dog that was that backed up to that particular property, but I don't think that was the reason that they wanted to rebuild the six foot fence. In their letter, they never indicated anything about a doll. It was well, just- Just pitching that as a reason that a six to yeah, a four foot I, I wouldn't- doing that. Yeah, if you have a jumper. If they did a four foot um, fence in the front and then, I don't know, six feet further back because they have a deck there, if they put a four right. foot fence there, yeah, uh, covering, I guess, on top of it, being part of the deck above, and then still have the six foot part in the, in the backyard. 
Yeah, I, I don't know why that wouldn't work for them. And that way they could actually get an administrative review without us changing an ordinance. I mean, you mean getting a zoning permit because they're in compliance? Have. Yes, no, because no administrative review, just a zoning permit because they're in compliance. Zoning permit. I mean, but it couldn't they do that? I mean, would someone recommend that to them or offer it to them that, hey, you can do this? And I, you know, I think that is a way of getting around it without us redoing ordinances because there's a lot of fences in town that are illegal and some of them are very sightly. And so this is a touchy situation. But if the four foot high fence would work and then they can move it to six foot, um, I think it could work. I, I just think somebody needs to offer it to them. Or maybe they need to think about it and apply for that I, I, with a drawing. I do think that they did uh, submit a uh, application or at least speak with our zoning officers, one of our zoning officers, and they were told that they would have to replace their fence with a four foot along the, along the side yard. Oh. The whole side yard. The whole side yard. From the front uh, building line to the rear building, building line. line, right? Then you can pick up six foot from the rear building line. It's well, that area of, that they did. That's what they system. wanted six foot between the front building line and the rear building line because they had that was a privacy issue. I think they split the driveway and you walk out of your house, and you know, that's that's what's been there. It's well, a very unique, it's a very unique situation that, that, property, on the side. that property is very unique it's there aren't a lot of properties like that in town well plus the adjacent if i'm thinking of the right one it's it's the one on walter correct that's got the it's there's a two-story garage that's right up on the property line on the adjacent property and their current stockade fence runs right along that uh, uh, well past the rear building line uh, and no, this is this is Vine the Street. property next to Freddie Weller on Walter. On Vine Street, I think it says. Well, Amazon. this is. Yeah, no, Mike's just. I had brought up a property on Walter, but it's not the same oh. one. Okay. The, the house on Walter is next to Freddie Weller's house, but not the double. Freddie lives in a double house, but it's the single house next to him, or he, you know, his wife was there. Mm -hmm. So this. But I don't know. I think maybe they should just go to the joint land use board then because I think they would get it because this property is unique in that it doesn't affect the front appearance at all. And the side yard runs along backyards to the properties on Burlington Avenue. That's where their side yard is. It, it, it backs up to a couple properties along Burlington Avenue. Mm -hmm. Maybe two or three. So, yeah, was, I've heard you know, from talking with board members and, and the administration, there was a, a long discussion on, on how far to ex extend and, and they came up with this uh, one third or 33% up the side of the, uh, of the house. Um, it, it seems that that's, that's just an oddball because many homes have a side entrance and it, it just starts to get a little ungainly there. And it seems- Yeah, and if, they're, if they're a foot off, I mean- Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. But it, it, partially it didn't seem because, you know, looking at many properties around town and fences that are in non-compliance, it seemed there was a fair number that had a six foot fence that came up to the front building line. Uh, as I said, not in compliance. Um, in a lot of cases, that doesn't seem to create a problem. Uh, in some new construction that may be infill, uh, and as example, you know, the type of housing over in Newton's Landing where you've got a garage that's, that's proud or forward of the rest of the residence, 
then if that's considered the front building line, now you've got a six foot fence that's way out there. And uh, that's, I think creates a, another issue. But, Do uh, they have any fences in Newton's Landing? No, no. no but I'm, I don't think they're allowed to have fences. But no, they're not allowed over there. But if, if there's some, you know, new construction that goes in and there's a garage there, the garages are usually set forward or proud of the, you know, they're in front or of the rest of the house. The front door is set back behind it. And so having that new front building line uh, really brings a six foot fence farther out into the front yard, uh, if you will. Um, There's some old. I, I would like to see that close to the street. When you bring it that close to the street, the house provides a very little setback as it is. If you add the six foot fence, it really becomes imposing. Yeah. And yeah. And this particular house is facing Vine Street, the side yard. It's not, it's not really, it may be the last house on Vine, but it's really not a corner property mm -hmm. in that there's a house on Burlington Avenue where there's like a section between the house and the other house where there's a garage. Yes. Yeah, that one. Burlington Avenue has a garage there. So it's not obstructing anything. Right. It's not, it, it it's not, um, it wouldn't look, it doesn't look bad other than the fence needs repair. Right. And, um, and it provides a visual screen for that resident to the looking at the side of that garage, as you say. Exactly. And there are other properties that that house backs up to from Burlington Avenue because there was a, 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 a terrible dog there that actually bit one of our residents in town and tore her dog up. That that fence protected the people that lived there before this this people before these people moved in. I, I guess the fence has been there for quite some time, but um, it doesn't it doesn't hurt anybody. It doesn't hurt any vision. It's not a bad thing to have that six foot fence there. So maybe if the joint land use board could see the visual that they could get their variance and and put the six foot fence there. I think that's the thing. And th th this is, I mean, we're almost serving as a hearing on the uh, the way the board would. I mean, I think everybody looks at that situation and says that, that seems reasonable and they would get their variance if they applied for it, but they're, they don't want to spend the money to apply for the variance. So there's been discussion about amending the code. The problem is if you amend the code, you, you create issues elsewhere right that wouldn't be That's my it, it would solve their problem but create potential issues elsewhere in town yeah um if if there was a way we had discussed the fee for a resident to be less than the escrow or what have you so that it's not such an expensive ordeal i mean that's one thing that i think would be something that the the board should maybe consider in a case like this, where you have a resident trying to improve his property, rep repair a fence and replace it. And it's not a visual obstruction. It's not going to look bad. It's actually going to improve the property because of the location that is there a way to just lower the fees? I mean, that that's the real, yeah. that's the real problem here is the fee structure. Um, want a, an economy variance process. And is, yes. Doug, is there, a, is there a way to have a fence variance not have to do a 200 foot mm -hmm. notice? Can it be removed from the land use portion from the zoning portion? So it can be just adjacent property owners or something much less onerous than the 200 foot rule? That's one of the cost yeah. issues that we don't yeah. control. The issue is it's a variance, right? If we could make it yeah. not be a variance, then we wouldn't have to send it to the board at all. Once it's a variance, that's- But you want the joint land use board to be the one making the judgment. We don't want to have that done on an administrative level. Uh, I don't think we- So that's- I mean, in certain ways, I don't think we can. Uh, and again, I did that draft ordinance, but I don't advocate for it because I don't think yeah. ultimately I don't that either. workable. 
can. But you can have a very low $25 application fee, waive any escrows, not have the professionals involved, but they still have to pay for a legal notice and they have to send out certified letters to all residents within 200 feet, which can be- Hundreds of dollars. Kitty, how many, how many, you know, for a place like that, how many of those would be? A lot, it's a lot. It's, it's, it's a, a densely really packed neighborhood. Yeah. So there would be a lot of notices. And when, once the board makes a decision, there has to be a resolution prepared um, memorializing that resolution. Uh, that, that hey, the decision. attorney for that? Yeah. I mean, there wouldn't be an, any engineering costs. So that wouldn't be a factor. Um, Unless they want the planner to give them advice. The board itself may ask that. Correct. And, and that's where I think maybe we could do, try to do some sort of, um, uh, I don't know how we phrase this and, and maybe we need to look around a little bit, but essentially like a rocket type uh, application. But with the understanding that if somebody applies for that application, under the theory that what they're proposing is so simple and they just want the board to make a call on it. If it's more complex than that, then we may need the ability to say, yeah, that's not gonna work here and, and we need to put it into a regular variance type of mode and get the planner's review letter um, because the factors are more complicated than just a simple application. Could they hand deliver the notice and do an affidavit uh, with a copy of the list? I know we did this yes. in yeah. law when I worked in law in the law firm when we did a lot Legally, of zoning sure. matters. Yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to mail the they notice. Have to you can you sign. Hand deliver them and sign an affidavit with a list attached saying that um, they served all these people. So that would get rid of eight dollars a letter right there. We got to pay um, the, the legal notice, and then as Kitty points out, the solicitor letter, it's probably going to end up being a couple hundred dollars minimum when you're all said and done, whether or not someone's willing to pay that, whether that's considered acceptable or not. Kitty, are the, are the people, uh, when they have to do this letter to the res, are, are they told that they can hand deliver that letter? That, or did, that information is in the public notice packet, yes. But they don't, the, the problem is residents don't know. They, they don't know. Yeah. If you've yeah. never done this before, you don't have a clue as to what you're doing. And, and I get that. So I, tr I try and help people, but if they don't do it right, then it costs them more money. Yeah. Right, I know, that's so. a problem. Um, well, Doug, you, you mentioned this this rocket application. How how is that different than a variance? It's just a it's just a type of variance where we say only residential for fence variances, and if we want to pick on any other really minor type categories. Mm -hmm. And I'd want the board's input on this because they're the ones that are going to have to process these things. Sure. But. Um, it might be a way to say to the to residents who would otherwise say, well, forget it, I'm just not gonna do it and I'm gonna leave a dilapidated fence sitting there. Yeah. You get the cost down enough to make it attractive to those people, then you know, I think we could probably put a system in place that doesn't lump the person seeking the fence fence variance in with the corporate entity down, you know, Cooperstown Road that's seeking to put in more parking or whatever the site plan amendments are. Or, or, or even someone in the residential addition or deck or something. There are those that require these variances and they do come in for those, but they're spending thousands of dollars. So this is not as big a, they generally will have a, 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 an architect that generally going through a professional phase anyhow. Right. This they're not. Um, well, they could just draw. They could draw the fencing maybe off their yeah, survey. Yeah, they can for this. That's what I'm saying. But if you're doing an addition, not just a corporate entity, but there are residents who do need to do these kind of variances where they they will use professionals. But you're right. All they need is is their uh, uh, survey, and they draw where it is on the survey plot. We could handle that issue 
the issue becomes the professional services. If you have to resolution and, and if you want, they want the planner's review, uh, well, the board may be not comfortable making these judgments without the planner's advice. The, the other issue is, um, surprisingly, people are not receiving surveys when they go to closing on their properties anymore. Good point. They have to pay. And so a lot of times a resident will come in and say, well, do you have a copy of, you know, do you have my survey or a survey in your files here? And we'll say, no, didn't you get one at closing? So they're, for whatever reason, not including official surveys in closing packets anymore. I don't know why. That's that's unheard of uh, because the title company either requires a survey affidavit with an old survey stating that no change is made or a survey because mortgage companies don't want to loan money on a, on a property that hasn't been surveyed and a title company has to ensure that that property is what it says it is and the legal description and the survey have to match. Yeah. So they have to have something. Someone told me that, oh, we didn't get a survey and uh, on a property. Every day. Yeah. And then, Every day somebody yeah. tells us that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We Lou's Deli, Lou's Deli told me he didn't get right. a survey. I said, you gotta be kidding and, me. Yeah. How could you settle? Yeah, and then they and, to the municipal building thinking we have to provide it right and, yeah and we've had actually had people get very angry that it's not provided by the township so there's a you know when you're dealing with the residential that resident seeking a variance versus a business you know who's got the attorney who's got the architect you know it's very very different and like Kit, like kitty said we try to help them as much as we possibly can through the application process the resident and explain without, um, you know, doing their application for them. Um, because the, the, you know, the resident who's not represented by attorney is not going to, you know, spend the money on engineering architectural it is just, um, it's not what they do for a living. It's not what it's not, it's not in their bailiwick. So, um, they, they have a hard time. They do, but this um, is such, this is just such a simple deal to me that Joe, can you do something? with the rocket application i mean uh, it sounds like it may work uh, I, I mean i mean so i would say let let's work towards that but we're yeah. so if we're going to do that though it's talking about amending the the, the board process i'd want them to, to they need to and yeah and, you know they need to be comfortable and feel that that's workable and i don't know the answer to that other than to say i do think there there is a difference between a simple fence variance versus, uh, you know, a more substantial variance that we might see on a on a corporate entity, and those get essentially treated the same in the land use process. There's no so distinction made under the MLU. Well, oh, right. Janice, Kitty, and, and Fern, during the discussion, you know, on the fence, you know. There's a lot of time on 33% and real building line and front building line. Was there any discussion of what Doug and, and Kate are talking about is, is some kind of streamlined uh, mechanism that would be acceptable to the board? Did, did anyone say, hey, this is silly. Why should we pull you know, a resident through, through a keyhole there and have them spend all kinds of money just to improve their property like we all want them to do? No, there was no discussion about modifying the uh, process. The board, there was quite a lengthy deliberation on this, but it didn't, did not include uh, modifying the process. There was, a, I think, a, a third split, not to use one third again, but <laughs> <laughs> some uh, board members were like, no, they have to put a four fence. And if they want to go higher than four, then they have to come in for the, for the variance. Another uh, group said, well, bring it to the uh, front front building line. And then another group said, well, maybe not the front building line, but so many feet. And then after a lengthy deliberation, 
um, if I remember correctly, it really wasn't a third, it was 30% and how somehow it got translated to one third, which is actually 33.33. Right, it was 30%. It was 30%. So Michelle actually, I think, um, translated that incorrectly in her letter in that the board compromised on 30% up the side yard. And Fern and I, Fern, I'm speaking for you, correct me if I, if I misspeak for you. We, we argued that an easy calculation for your zoning officer, for your construction, an easy way to measure it would be 50%. Yeah. Was, was fit, we, Fern and I argued for 50%. They, you know, uh, other people wanted not, nothing, four foot, or you come to the board for your variance. And then, so there was this compromise to 30%, not one third, but 30%. Um, but even then, you know, um, I, I, myself, I still stick with 50%. I think it's a, um, it's a fair calcul, it's an easy calculation. It's one half. The length of that, you know, side building uh, line, it's easily measurable, um, and it would encompass and incorporate a lot of those side entrances um, without coming all the way to the front. There was concern about um, uh, the view shed; that term was used, um, you know, out, you know, coming right to the front of the building line. And again, at fifty percent, and um, you know, with those that. And we do have some houses that have the garages or that L-shaped house like Richards Avenue, um, where if you stop it at 50%, it would never make it to that into that front yard. Yeah. So um, there was, but there was never a discussion about modifying the process. Would it be useful for, for the committee, the task, the planning board to look at this, uh, look at some kind of fast track or a rocket or whatever you want to call it um, and just yeah. say, I, yeah. I think it would be a, an application package just for fences that would spell out that they could hand deliver the letter. I mean, really like A, B, C, as basic as you can make it for them. Um, and uh, just a separate package. Our joint land use, our package is pretty thick. Yeah, and it covers I don't think that's something that the board should do. The board, the board members, they're, they're all volunteers. Yeah. I try and do as much as I can for the board because they're volunteering their time to sit there for these hearings. And I don't feel that it's appropriate to ask them to sit down and redesign a, an application. I don't know that we have to have that now, be the ones to redesign, but I do want to so not just redesign right. it and send to them and say, here's what you're doing now. Correct. So, so what I So we would could, need your input. Well, what I could maybe do is um, check with some other municipalities and see if they have other be options. My suggestion, since we're in one of the historic riverfront communities from Bordentown, uh, you know, all the way south, into, they have to have the same problem. Yeah. My question is, this property in question on Vine Street, the side uh, yard issue, uh, I heard it mentioned earlier that uh, it, this, that side yard is somebody else's backyard on yes. Burlington Avenue? Yes. So, so if the Burlington Avenue resident said, hey, I want to put up a six foot fence in my backyard, he can yeah. do that. But, but this Vine Street resident can't do mm -hmm. that. No, because it's a side yard. So, so, so that doesn't make sense that because I have a six foot fence in my backyard, but it's my neighbor's side yard. And I tapered it up from the four foot up, you know. Yeah. Uh, just not to be in any trouble. But when you come down Burlington Avenue, it looks a little weird, but I'm within my right to have that six foot fence in my backyard. Um, I don't understand. So if the front neighbor on Burlington Avenue said, hey, I want a six foot fence, they have no problem. They go right through, correct? So I think our ordinance has to reflect that the corner properties in these scenarios are, are um, they, they should have a separate set of rules that if somebody's backyard lines up to a side yard, then the backyard set the backyard rule applies. It's it's, I, you know, we're not going to be able to come to a conclusion on this because we keep kicking it back and forth to Lane Sport, kicking it back and forth between us. I, I really think the planner should have picked up on that that the uh, backyard uh, to one house is the side yard to another house, and if that is the case, then um, they they should be allowed. To
So um, did the planning board take a look at the property, Janice? Uh, yes. Yes, everybody was very familiar with uh, the situation there. Do we have a, a house number? Because as we were talking, I was on Google Maps walking the neighborhood. I think it's 327. I thought I found the right location based upon the description, but it's, I'm not right. Although I do I remember walking in that neighborhood back when the municipal building was in the old location. And I'm pretty sure that yeah. dog scared the <laughs> daylights out. Yeah. 327 Vine. It's 327 Vine, right. Doug. I'm getting a twin, is that right? Yeah, because yeah, what, what happens in the future, and as you guys said, you know, somebody didn't get surveyed this or that, a lot of times when, uh, you know, a, a house is purchased, people find out, hey, that fence is mine or it's not mine. I didn't put it up, but you know, there's no history of who put it up. So as long as all the fence models fall into place within the town, there shouldn't be an issue because most people who move or abandon their property Nobody knows who put the fence up anyway. Well, the people that live there now live on Orchard. Um, they bought Mrs. Bell's house on Orchard, and I don't know if they put that fence up. No, uh, not these the people. Time. The people who okay. these people bought it from. Um, so it sounds, I don't, it sounds like a simple fix. It's, it, it's a unique situation, if you ask me. It's different. Then the six-foot fence would be allowed. I just have to say yeah. though, and I'm not criticizing these people because I know it's an investment, but this is the kind of stuff that the board gets all the time. Um, I, you know, I sit as a board attorney in places. These applications are filed and routinely granted uh, because they have reasons for them. So if they had filed, I think if they had filed the application for the variance, they would have gotten it and they'd be well on their way. Yeah. But there's still a doubt, Doug. That's the problem here. People don't want to put up hundreds or a few thousand dollars to ask a question and get rejected. Well, people don't municipalities have do not have favorable, Municipalities do not have a favorable uh, uh, reputation on grading variances. And, um, you know, so that's really, I, in a way, homeowners are looking to circumvent. Yeah. The process. I hear you. And and if you're only going to spend a few hundred dollars on fencing and then the fence is going to be doubled in cost by a variance, I get it. And the fences don't last either. Usually the life expectancy of a fence, you have to replace it eventually. They, they all rot and they're all crappy. Uh, or so is there something in the ordinance that could de depict uh, side yard and backyard, if it's a common line, if it's a common property that connects a, a backyard to a side yard, uh, then a six foot fence should be allowed. Because if he puts a four foot fence and then the new neighbor on Burlington Avenue, let's say who, whoever it is or is going to be, says, oh, geez, no, I want my six foot fence. He's going to put a, a six foot fence in front of that guy's four foot fence and he's allowed to do it. But the four foot guy, he's still got his little four foot railing there with a six foot behind it you follow me yeah yeah okay i don't want to beat this dead horse i think we really I'm, have to I'm done. i mean i have tried okay. everything to come to to come to some resolution here but it, kitty i like your idea um when i was on riverton's planning board for a while when i lived there for a short time and um, I did a couple fence ordinances for them actually. And, but I would check with a couple other communities and in the area to see if they have a simple process for someone to go to the joint land use board, a packet for a fence. And um, I would be happy to sit down and um, help work through that for our residents. Um, and also, I think it would help the joint land use board. I mean, I, I would be happy to work with you on that. If you could check into it to see if you can find some other communities that have a special application for fence. Okay. All right. That would be less involved. Right. right. And let's take it from there. Good idea. All right. So we go that direction and Doug will see if he can find a rocket somewhere. 
uh, we'll look at uh, John Brown's point of the <clears throat> rear fence line in the side yard and see if uh, there's some fix there. So, and we'll talk about this on the what, December 7th, I guess. Uh, status of Township Committee meeting. Uh, uh, no, it's Star Court. Number three under discussion. Board. I mean, I don't know that that they just want to change their name sure. to History Board. Makes sense. Make it it's short and sweet. Um, so when they're in another event out of town, they can just say we're the Lanco History Board. Any objections? Well, we already have codification with the Historic Preservation Advisory Board. Would we have to change everything? Yeah, the ordinance. It's in your packet. There is a, a sample ordinance or a draft ordinance that would change the name and amend that chapter of the code. Let me do that. Uh, yeah, I just want to big deal. This is uh, Steve McLaughlin here. Just want to make one uh, small correction. Um, the agenda uh, says uh, the new name would be History Board. Um, yes. I think our intention was for the new name to be Delanco History Board. Well, I sent that to Doug and I also sent his reply to Peter and John. Uh, Doug, do you want to address that like you did in my email? Because um, it's not necessary to have Delanco in the code, but we can use the name. Yeah, it's not typical. So when we set forth all of our groups or entities that we're recognizing or creating in our code, we give them the name, you know, uh, Environmental Commission, History Board. Uh, the way it's stated right now, it's Historic Preservation Advisory Board but it's the Delanco Historic Preservation Advisory Board. And so that is a function of the fact of that it's an entity of the township created by the code, but it's not typically set forth in the code itself. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yep, that, so, that makes perfect sense. Just wanted to check. Yeah, okay. okay. So by taking out the word advisory, does that- Preservation advisory. Right. So, it's still all the same operational language remains the same. So it still performs all the same advisory functions. It doesn't change the qualifications of the entity. Right. Legal. Right. right. I, you know, I was here for the part of this. I was there when we started this. And the, the name was very, uh, you know, thought out. The, um, you know, the advisory board, there was a reason for that, okay? And um, I think because we didn't want to set a separate commission. Hey, you were there. Now, uh, I was there, Jackie DiCarlo was the one I, who wanted this. Actually, I think it was the mayor, John. Um, and uh, it was just the name that she picked at that time. And the board, we have a very active history board and it is, cumbersome this name is cumbersome but it still covers the same thing so it doesn't the what we do doesn't have to be defined in the name um and history board would cover everything and it would just be simpler um and uh so I, i'm in favor of changing it to history board the whole board was unanimous and i don't know why we wouldn't do it i have to say that i think i probably came up with that terminology uh, oh, okay. <laughs> something I would have written. That's fun. I don't know. You know, you're talking yeah. history. Part of the history is this original name. Like why change history? <laughs> no, right. they want to change it. All right. Because they're the ones that do all the activities outside of town as well. All right. Well, Thurman, as a member of the board, um, we are talking about printing some uh, signage in the coming year, uh, some signs for the the uh, Gateway Park and a few other places around town. And so if we're putting, basically we, this would be the time to change our name because we're about to put our name on a bunch of signs. Okay. Right. Yep. Is there a fatal flaw in not doing this? Uh, we, we should change it. We should change it because putting this name on signage is an additional cost to us and it's long and it's gonna take up yeah. too much space. Sure answer. And we're going to be doing a lot of signage. So it's it's recommended that we change it to the history board. All right. Everybody in agreement on this ordinance, proposed ordinance? Um, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not fond of it. I, I got to be honest. I, I just think it's it's petty. I'm sorry. Um, 
I, I don't know why we're going to start changing things that have been around for a while. But you call the vote. I guess I looked upon advisory as uh, they advising the township committee or a correct, correct, an extension of the township committee. That's and still all, all that's the boards good. are extension. That's why, that's why I think I probably am the one who put that language in there because that's a <laughs> that's a term of art, right? To be an advisory board as opposed to uh, something that has authority to act on its own in a lot of ways but but what i'm saying is is that the ordinance substantively isn't changing right but when it comes time to budget okay the you know the library board is is their own entity and we budget them uh money and the uh, you know the the other boards when it comes to economic advisory uh, council when it comes to historic preservation advisory board uh, I know Richard pretty much, uh, you know, approves those uh, funded items that uh, they, they expend. So I, I don't know if budgetary is an issue with this. Um, no, in fact, that's... We come aboard. I know we've had this problem in town before uh, with the like of Youth Sports Association and uh, the Recreation Commission. There always seems to be a pullback. Everybody wants to be on their own and they want us to leave them alone. And they to me... Hold on, excuse me. By changing the name again, I think we're kind of setting these guys off sale and uh, perhaps maybe we lose some of our uh, connection. That's my- uh, You're missing the point. You're totally missing the point. No, I didn't miss the point, Kate. You're telling me it's gonna save printing fees. But it's gonna save a lot of printing fees, yes. And it also makes sense because it is the Delanco History Board. Yes, they are. They're, the ordinance isn't changing other than the name. It's not changing. I mean, I can't believe we're arguing over this. No, it's just you arguing, Kate. You, 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 not, you not the it's arguing only you. I'm stating my opinion. Okay? It's still on the advisory board. So it becomes their nickname. Yeah. Yeah. So my name is Fernand Olette, but people call me Fern Olette. That doesn't change who I am. Right. So and that's... In essence, I think what you're trying to do here with the history board. Yes. I know it's not a big, so, big deal. I just it, it can we have a vote, Mike? No, no. Why are they pulling the, you know, on something that we invented 20 years ago? Kate, do you want to talk to John, and we'll we'll readdress this on the seventh. No, I'm not going to talk to John about it. I think we ought to have a vote. Are on you it. on the board, Kate? Are you on the history? Yeah. Okay. I am their so liaison. Okay. And I'm a voting member. And I have been since it started. You gotta remember, I was I was one of the ones who suggested this board. Okay, back in the early two thousands. Jackie DiCarlo fought for it actually, if you recall. Uh, let's, uh, let's let's de let's defer this till the seventh, and uh, let uh, the respective committee members uh, sort it out, and we'll move on with the agenda since the hour is getting long, and we still have some things to cover. And uh, unless there you go, all right. I lost my page here. All right, where am I? Uh, History board calendar. We'll look at the calendar and figure out what days, uh, block out the holidays and pick some dates and we'll send it to Mrs. Lohr and we'll have a calendar on the 7th to look at, right? Yeah, it was just in the packet tonight so that you can start looking at um, 2021. Uh, and uh, so when we get together on the 7th, um, you can, the Township Committee can uh, start uh, scheduling the meetings for 2021. There are a few uh, holidays yep. uh, that would be right when we're going to meet or right the day after. So it's something you want to take a look at. Um, and then it'll be back on the agenda right. for the seventh. We'll make our picks for the meeting dates for 2021. And uh, since we'll be meeting in the same room on our screens for uh, probably the first half of it. All right. Uh, real quick, Mayor, if I may. Um, please. 
on ordinances. Uh, we're getting towards the end of the year. And just a reminder that any ordinance that you would introduce in 2020 that is not adopted by the end of this year uh, dies. You would have to come back in 2021 and reintroduce that ordinance, all right. uh, start the process all over again. So if the history board's ordinance isn't changed December 7th, then it has to start all over again. Is that what you're saying? Or well, to if you're bringing it back on the 7th and um, you haven't decided to introduce that on the 7th, um, then it basically isn't going to happen in 2020. If you introduce it, uh, introduce the ordinance and set the public hearing for the 21st, December 21st, you could get it adopted by the, um, by the end of the year. But if you don't act on it, um, on the seventh, then you you can you really can't introduce it on the twenty first unless you call a special meeting. You know, uh, basically the end of the year, like December thirtieth, <laughs> because you have to let so many days go in between publication yeah. if you introduce an ordinance. Well, well, so well, I just wanted to, well, yeah. and that's and that would be that wasn't specifically for this ordinance. It was just a procedural reminder about yeah, because right. then there has to be public meeting for it. So if it's, so that's why I wanted the vote for at least the first reading tonight and then the public meeting would be December 7th. Right. Or like I said, if uh, after your deliberations on the 7th, you decide to introduce it, you can introduce it on the 7th and have public hearing, and a second reading, public hearing and adoption on the 21st, your last scheduled meeting of the year. Okay. okay. But you're gonna be, well, that, that's procedurally what would happen. All right. Okay. We'll Thank you. Tie it up in a nice bow there. All right, uh, that concludes the agenda. We've got a resolution. Uh, we have uh, an executive session that's needed. Uh, um, it will be resolution. Let me get the last one. Uh, one thirty-four. Need a motion for, for uh, I know we have um, attorney client uh, a pilot pay, payment in lieu of taxes update. Um, are there other matters that don't that fall outside of attorney client? Doug, no. you said you had a couple things. No, it's all attorney client. I'll be right okay. back. Okay. Right, motion for resolution uh, one thirty four, please, for uh, resolution for executive session. So move. Second, please. Second. And all those in favor. I think we need a roll call. It's a resolution, Mayor. Um. So, Mr. Brown? He stepped away. Okay. And Ms. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Ms. Holland? Yes. Mr. Olatz? Yes. Mr. Templeton? Yes. Okay. We are in executive session at this time. Um, Aaron, can you set up that um, breakout room? Yeah. So, I'm putting in all the committee members plus Doug and Richard? And myself. And yourself. Mm -hmm. And just to make it clear for the public, if you would like to stay on the, the Janice, is that correct? The, anybody in the public who's there can stay on while we're in the breakout room during the executive in case there's anything to be heard after the executive session, correct? Right. If, if the township committee, after they adjourn out of executive session, can come back into public session and take formal action, if there's anything to take formal action on, and the public... Would be I'll entitled to that. Uh, I'm not going to be recommending any formal action, no. so, so I don't. It usually think isn't, but no. um, is Kitty included in the session in the executive session? Sure, she's got to do the minutes. Yes. Okay. Just I checking. Janice does the minutes. I, I do executive session. Oh, is that, oh, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So I was no. keep you around, Kitty. If, I'm <laughs> if I don't have to, I'm good to go. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so that's up to you. It's your decision. <laughs> It doesn't matter. Kitty's in, in her capacity as deputy municipal clerk. She, clerk. She's also in a, a confidential employee. So that's correct. It doesn't matter. So is that a yes or a no? That's all I need. <laughs> it's a no from Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. It's not legally required. Yeah, excuse uh, Mr. Fenimore, Mr. Uh, Fox, and uh, Chief DeSanto. <laughs> I can leave. I'm, I'm leaving. Okay, everybody, hang on. I'm switching you to a breakout room and I have to turn off the recording before you speak. So hold on just a moment.